Is this thing on? Are you ready, Matt? You're listening to Box Office Binges with Matt Diaz and Ernesto Santos. Good evening, folks. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Box Office Binges. Hello and welcome to another episode of Box Office Bingers. Ernesto, we have a an potential Oscar contender, at least one that's being looked at around the award season. Let's put it that way. Uh, tell our lovely listeners what we are reviewing so this week. We are reviewing The Holdovers, starring Paul Giamatti, Dom Sessa, and Divine Joy Randolph, directed by Alexander Payne who uh, directed The Descendants, Nebraska, Downsizing, and Election. He also directed um, Sideways, which was also starring Paul Giamatti. Um, Mm -hmm. Written by David Hemmingson. This is his feature film debut and the creator of Whiskey Cavalier. It only lasted for about one season on ABC. I've never never seen it, have you? Nope. Nope. (laughs) Actually, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, for who plays Maggie from the walking dead i think this was the show that she left the walking dead for and then it only lasted one season and then she came back uh Uh, lauren Lauren conan lauren cohen is maybe i think her name is hold on let me look it up i think that's her name yeah lauren cohen you're right yeah okay yeah yeah i'm pretty sure she left she left The Walking Dead for for this show, and then she, when it, when it only lasted one season, she eventually came back, and I think that's when they started the whole Negan Maggie storyline. It's still going strong, I guess. But regardless, I never watched it. I never really. We never got that far in either one of those shows. So <laughs> by all means, <laughs> um, but I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you, As especially with I. the holdovers, because we had talked about. Um, this being not, well, we said at the end of last week's episode that we were not looking forward to this movie uh, because yeah. the trailer did not do it justice. Absolutely not. And I, so I, I, I'm, I'm go ahead. No, I, I think I think we I think we both I feel like I feel like we both have both have a lot to say about this movie. There is yeah. there is a lot to say about a lot of different things when it pertains to this movie. So I think this is definitely a conversation that like. You know, we had planned to to re- to talk about this the other day, but we actually got held up just kind of like working on stuff, getting stuff ready for the show, and mm-hmm. then within that, I felt like I was able to do a little bit more research on the movie. And mm. man, do I have some things to say! Oh, interesting. Okay, well, I'm really excited. Uh... I'm just really excited. I mean, I'm not gonna bury the lead. Like I, I re- overall, I think it was great. I think I just can't wait to get into that conversation with you. Um, this is definitely, obviously, going to be in the conversation for the Oscars for next year. I think, for, I mean, without without a doubt, you can we can at least say that. <laughs> yeah, and and as we dive into the news in just a little bit, we're going to be talking about the holdovers in 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 little bits and pieces as we kind of go through. Because what's funny is that you mentioned that we were going to record three days ago. Mm-hmm. We're going to record this episode three days ago, and our news was not much because it was just coming off the Thanksgiving. Not much was happening, all that stuff. In the matter of three days, Ernesto, we went from having two news stories to about seven or eight yeah. right now. Yeah, it it was it's a lot. Zero to so one hundred. It's no joke. Uh, so let's dive right into it. We're going to be doing what you're watching a little bit later in the show, but for right now, it's official, everybody. The sag after actors strike is officially over. After weeks of voting, the 2023 TV slash theatrical contracts have officially been ratified by the sag after members by a vote of 78.33% to 21.67% with a turnout of 38.15%, which in my opinion, that turnout is very low. If we're going off of, off of 100, that means about 38% of your members decided to vote on this. It's, it's, I mean, it sounds like they got just enough. 
I mean, I right. majority rules. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, off, but also between the thirty eight percent that did vote, it was an overwhelming yes. Seventy eight percent of that decided that we're going to go okay. for this. Seventy. Okay, but let's let's. So yeah, I, I know we're talking about seventy eight percent of the thirty eight percent of Correct. the total body that they represent. Yes, that's what we're talking about. So we're not even talking about thirty eight percent. We're talking about whatever that I'm. I'm in. I'm in production. I don't do math. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're 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 not talking about practice. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing out sports terms. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess regardless, the strike is over. Yeah, the pe- for, for the people who wanted to vote. They did that. They had about a week or so, maybe a little bit longer to do that because of the Thanksgiving holiday and everything. But we went over the details back on episode 194. So if you want to listen to what just some of what they were fighting for and what they got approved on and what some of the contract was, go back to listen to that episode. But for right now, it took from, I don't know, from either April or May all the way to right now. All the strikes are officially over. Hollywood is in full swing back in production. They've already announced a few delays on a few projects that we've talked about before, but, and then they've already changed some dates on a few things, but now everything is back on track. Yeah. But you know, that's, that's to be expected. We, 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 um, we knew going forward that there was going to be a period where there wasn't going to be much content coming out. Yeah. And I, and I feel like entering early January and February, I feel like we're going to start seeing that a little bit. Because even like looking at the theaters, there's not like big tent poles, not until like March or April or something. Mm. Um, but anyway, uh, congratulations for the SAG AFTRA members. Uh, and the strike is officially over. And the same for the writers' strike. That's all gone. Writers Guild, everyone's back to work now. So, yeah, hopefully everyone got what they wanted. I mean, they probably didn't, but not everything, but they, they got something to move the ball forward. And that's, that's something better than they didn't have before. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, with that, uh, we're going to be talking about the 29th annual Critics' Choice Awards TV nominations have been announced. The film nominations will, for some reason, not be announced until December 13th. So at the at, at the time of this recording, uh, those, nom- those film nominations have not been announced. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go over some of the highlights from the TV nominations. The Morning Show received the most nominations in the drama categories with six nominations. And The Bear and Abbott Elementary received the most nominations for the comedy category with four nominations. I do, on, on, a, on a side note, I do find it kind of weird that they don't just announce TV and film at the same time, yeah. like pretty much every other uh, award show. But I, I guess maybe this, this gives them, they can stretch it out a little bit. I'm not sure if it's different committees between TV and movies, but regardless, as you can see in the screen, for those who are watching on YouTube, those are your your top films. Uh, sorry, t- not films. Your top TV shows that are being nominated. Um, Vanessa, let's start with the drama series. Uh, we have The Crown on Netflix, The Diplomat also on Netflix, The Last of Us on HBO Max, Loki on Disney Plus, The Morning Show on Apple TV Plus, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds, which is on Paramount Plus. Succession, which is on Max, and Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty, that's also on Max. Isn't that the one that got canceled, but then they pushed, but then like the, was it the creator or the owner of the Lakers was like really pushing? I remember there was some big social media push. We we may have briefly talked about it a, a while ago. This is just, I remember hearing about that. So it's interesting to see that it was mm-hmm. nominated, even though it was on the verge of being canceled. I, I think it, it did, did get, get canceled. canceled. That's right. It did. It did get right. canceled. Yeah. So it only lasted two seasons, but hell, I mean, they're getting some award buzz out of it. So it's, uh, I guess it's a little too late on that, but I, think, I guess they can still read in something, but not, not to yeah, save it. Not show, enough to save itself. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to see Loki up there. I honestly wasn't expecting Loki to be up there for among the best drama uh, series. Uh, the morning show succession, the crown, was all you know repeats from previous years uh the last of us a new edition that has a good chance of winning to be honest with you um i'm also surprised to see star trek yeah, up there that's a that's an as... interesting one so i, mm-hmm. I don't like what is the premise of strange new worlds i'm not i'm not really a big tr- trekkie i know david would be yelling at me right now because he loves mm-hmm. he's, he's, he loves this show <laughs> i'm pretty sure uh it's it's a prequel to the original star trek sh- series so i think 
if I had to guess, I think these characters are going off the William Shatner, uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, kind of those original, like Captain Kirk and, and Spock and stuff like yeah. that. So I, th- so I see. So I no, yeah. it's, it, it's on IMDb. It's listed as a prequel to the original series, like you said, that show that, mm-hmm. that follows the USS Enterprise under Captain Christopher Pike. Oh so Pike! Is, oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. that's right. So this is that. So so my so I was wrong. It pre. It, it it was before Shatner and 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 yeah. Nimoy. Um, got All it. All right. Well, this sounds like a good jumping yeah. on point for maybe somebody who wasn't a Trekkie fan. Like I don't know this, the fact that something so niche as Star Trek to be even listed mm-hmm. in the Critics' Choice that says, hey, there might be just the same thing as we try to get people to marvel so there there must be something there for even the casual viewer to to enjoy so yeah i heard it was very similar to the style of what the jj abrams star trek movies were Mm -hmm. it was like it's very action heavy there's like again drama within the 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 enterprise and so i've seen that trailer and i was like this looks really good i've been waiting with megan because she was also interested so i haven't started it yet but it looks it looks good so uh, now that the fact that it's been nominated for the Critics' Choice, it just shows, like you were saying, more bones to it. It's like, oh, maybe there's something there for the average man and not something as niche as for the followers. And again, the same goes for Loki as well. Yeah, and, that, and but like to me, like me seeing that, that's a sign for me to go, oh, like maybe I should. It's more of a reason for me to give this show a, a shot. Because cause like a lot mm-hmm. of people who seem to, who are big Star Trek fans love this show. And it's like, all right. But maybe that's because like you're niche into this content. Like you know how people look at Star mm-hmm. Wars. Like so, it's yeah. that, that's kind of where I was at with it. But now seeing this, I feel a little bit more apt to try it out. So looking forward to it. Yeah, and I, I am curious who's gonna take the 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 winning. Who's gonna win this particular best drama? Uh, because the Crown and Succession both ended their series. Mm. So. They both have legs to win it, even though I'm pretty sure they both won it before. Um, I would love to see it go to somebody else because I feel like they've always won the awards for it. But, you know, this is hard for me. We'll see. Because for me, based on I, which I haven't seen this previous season of the morning show, um, mm-hmm. I haven't and I haven't finished Loki, but just off look like. I would love to see it go to the last to the bear. I think this last season of the bear was phenomenal. But oh, that for for for, for drama. drama. Uh, yes, for drama. Did I not say that? Oh, I'm sorry. The bear yeah, is for comedy. I, excuse yeah. me. Um, but Succession had such a strong ending. So and mm. like The Last of Us was great, but it's still very niche. To it's a little bit more niche. I don't know. I kind of see it maybe going for Succession. Yeah, it's honestly it's a hard sell. I mean, it can go. I mean, if I were to give top contenders, it would probably either be The Crown because it always wins, The Last of Us, or Succession. It's it's going to be one of those three. It's I'll be surprised if any and if any other one wins it. Um, I'll be delighted to see it, but I don't I don't see it happening. Um, I mean, I, I don't think Loki's getting it, but the non the nomination is good. Uh, I appreciate at the least nomination. the recognition, at least uh, the nod. Yeah, exactly. Um, for best comedy series, we have Al- Abbott Elementary on ABC, uh, Barry on HBO and Max, The Bear on FX, The Marvelous Miss Maisel on Prime Video, Poker Face on Peacock, Reservation Dogs on FX, Shrinking on Apple TV yeah. Plus, and What We Do in the Shadows on FX. I think I there's a lot of shows that we watched uh, out of this category. Um, Abbott Elementary won, I'm pretty sure, last year. So it's nice to see that this this uh, I think it was a third season, mm-hmm. I believe. Or no, it was the second season. Second season. Um, this is getting recognition. Um, we'll talk about Barry a little bit later in episode because I I finished Ooh. it from our last conversation we had. Our what you're watching? Soft tease. <laughs> um, never saw Miss Maisel. I thought Poker Face was fine. I never really got into Reservation Dogs. I'm delighted to see Shrinking yeah. up there. To be honest, that's that's kind of out of this category. I mean, I've seen Abbott. I've seen Barry. I've seen the Bear. I've seen Miss Maisel. I mean, I actually, I remember, I don't know if you remember, like a couple of months ago, I know I vary. Sometimes I'll just start shit and then I'll just won't ever talk about it again. That means I've watched it and I've, yeah. <laughs> that means I've lost interest. That means it's no, it's no yeah, longer, it's enough. no longer in consideration for me to continue. There's a reason why I haven't finished watching it. 
Um, I mess with a lot of shit. Like, I'll just start it. I, I at least give it a shot. I give it like two or three episodes. Yeah, why not? It's like, nope, this is trash. Like, nope. I'm just like, or it's good. Like I can see the quality, but it's just, maybe it's just not for me. And I think that's where I was Mm -hmm. at with reservation dogs. I made it, I think I made it maybe about four or five episodes in uh, before I kind of was like, I'm good. Like I I see what you're trying to do here. Like I can respect it. It's just like, like it's like very coming of age, but I I just, I'm not in it. That's like CW shit type for me. Like, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, it was fine but i'm loving that shrinking is on there my top two for this and i think as i mistakenly mentioned before um i would love to see it to either to go for the bear but it's a hard sell between the bear and shrinking with the with the with the with the slight edge given to the bear um yeah i i would have to agree with you there i think abbott elementary won this one last year but it's the bear's turn yeah. to shine i'm just saying like I love shrinking though. I, I, and I've been pretty sure it got renewed for a second season. Um, but as far as the newcomers, I think, yeah, I've seen Abbott. I've seen Barry. I've seen the bear. I've seen poker face and I've seen shrinking. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I feel like the bear, especially a lot of the buzz that it was having earlier this year, I feel like it has enough legs to stand as as one of the best comedies. And it's, it's hard to even call it a comedy. Yeah. It really like it's like the bear's really more of a dramedy and that's and that's maybe why i just kind of thought mm-hmm. of it that way because it seems more of like a drama that has comedic elements as opposed to mm-hmm. a comedy that tends to have serious moments like if i feel it leaning more especially this last season this last season was so deep mm-hmm. i felt like they ex- they explored so, so many good there was so much good writing just in so much great cinematography and just kind of the way they put everything together it was just a very well constructed story i am surprised to yeah. see abbott elementary on there only because i felt like the last season was rushed which is not the fault of the mm-hmm. series because given I think it was interrupted due due to the strike so they had to like abruptly right. end their season and i felt that watching the final episode like i watched it and i was like oh that's that's the end of the season like <laughs> we're not gonna like and i get and, and you know they kind of ended it with the anticipation of that being the end and you know they didn't really have mm-hmm. much time to wrap it up so i i i understand that like you know they had a whole almost a whole other half a season to get to get whatever they were trying to get across it just felt it felt very abrupt like I, did you did you get a chance you did get to finish abbott elementary right yeah no i, I caught myself up yeah i mean i thought the ending was fine like I the mean, whole i didn't really like the think whole it... leslie odom jr his whole his whole storyline i felt like that was just very rushed like we we had just yeah. like we just got the reveal who this guy is and then like the thing was over in like an episode it's like peace out charter school yeah we got this <laughs> spoiler alert for the last season but still yeah <laughs> I mean, again, it's it's very telling that, you know, not a lot of cable television are even getting these types of rewards. And we've talked about this before. It's all streaming. So Abbott Elementary is one of the few shows that are pushing cable television into the awards conversation. But FX has always been doing that for years. I feel like FX has been in the exception for years that they've been creating great content that's not on streaming. You can find it on Hulu um, and the same for Abbott Elementary on the next day. But they're originating they're originating out of abc and fx um so good for albert elementary for kind of just like hey i i'm cable i there's some there's something good to watch over here that you know that's a that is a really that is a really good point because you don't see when was the last time you saw a network tv show on here yeah i mean aside from last year it was it was abbott elementary and it was always a show on fx if it was a that's what uh, i'm saying yeah if it was on cable so yeah so there's that and uh, the so one. then yep. we are going to go to best limited series. So that's Beef on Netflix, Daisy Jones and Six on Prime Video, Fargo on FX, Fellow Travelers, Fellow Travelers on Showtime, Lessons in Chemistry on Apple TV Plus, Love and Death on Max, uh, A Murder at the End of the World FX, A Small Light National Geographic. Um, yeah, I've seen. I've seen uh, like two or three of these. I've seen Beef and I've seen Love and Death. Uh, Love and Death was fantastic. What a what a fantastic uh, limited series, especially on something that was already on a topic that was already previously covered from a completely different angle on the story. Mm-hmm. So it it was great. I really enjoyed it. I think uh, Jesse Plemons. I mean that guy doesn't miss. He's he's so. Mm-hmm. He's so good in everything that he's in. Everything he he in, he kills. He kills in mm-hmm. every role he does. Um, so, uh, 
I don't I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a dog. I liked beef, but I didn't really care for the the ending didn't land for me. Yeah, I agree with that. And but I mean, Beef was the only show that I've seen from this limited series. So um, I also I find it hard to say that Fargo is a limited series uh, because yeah. it's they have multiple seasons every year, every few years. It's just it's an anthology series. So I guess it's being I mean, sure, I guess. OK. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Beef is the only one I've seen. I remember liking it. For, for what it was, I do agree with you. The ending was the only part of it that was a little bit choppy. But, um, but yeah, I mean, aside from Love and Death and Fargo, like, that was the only buzz out of those three shows. Beef, Fargo, and Love and Death were the only shows that were getting buzz. Yeah. Lessons in Chemistry just came out, so no one's really talking about it. I know, it's still so, airing. Aren't they still releasing still episodes? Airing. Yeah, <laughs> they're still releasing it, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I I would just based off a of word of mouth, I think beef has a good chance of getting it. Also, it does have the the most uh, it's tied for the second most nominations with four. Um, and also to mention, uh, Loki has four, which I'm honestly quite surprised with. Tom Hiddleston also got best actor uh, in, a, in a drama series and Kihu Kwan got best supporting actor in a drama series. So like. Like, I think the ones that have more nominations are more likely to win the top award, but that's not always true, though. Mm. Uh, so the 29th Annual Critics' Choice Awards will be airing live on The CW Saturday, Saturday January 14th of 2024. So once those come out, um, we look and we'll get a recap from us. I'm inter- interested to see how this is going to play out. Yeah, especially that the because uh, because of the the uh, the ongoing strikes from the writers and the actors, the Emmys got pushed back to January as well. It was mm-hmm. that, I think those awards were supposed to happen in October or in September, yeah, I and think now it was September. Yeah, and then they got pushed back all the way to January. I think January seventh, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, so uh, there might be a week. Apart. <laughs> I thought I say that out loud. Uh, but anyway, moving on from the Critics' Choice, we're going to be talking about the National Board of Review have announced their 2023 honorees, with top awards going to Killers of the Flower Moon for Best Film, Martin Corsese for Best Director for the film Killers of the Flower Moon, Paul Giamonti for Best Actor for The Holdovers, and Lily Gladstone for Best Actress for Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon taking four, uh, three out of the four top Awards established in 1909, the National Board of Review is an organization that recognizes excellence in filmmaking and is dedicated to discussing and selecting what its members regard as the best film works of each year. This year, 245 films were viewed by selection by a selection group of film enthusiasts, filmmakers, professionals, academics, and students many of which were followed by in-depth discussions with directors, actors, producers, and screenwriters. Among the top films are Barbie, The Boy and the Heron, Ferrari, The Holdovers, The Iron Claw, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, and Poor Things. This is an interesting collection on the list. I mean, with Killers of the Flower Moon kind of sweeping it, which, Mm -hmm. okay, that. I I get it. There's a lot. There's definitely a lot. There's a lot to appreciate there. With, I mean, giving it to Scorsese. I mean, we. I mean, we talked about it in that when we reviewed it about everything that involved that massive production. Yeah, I can obviously see it. I can see it for Paul Giamatti for the holdovers. I mean, mm-hmm. and if anything for Killers of the Flower Moon, Lily Gladstone should take it. She was absolutely fantastic. Her first time, her first film, and that's how great she was. I mean, just. That's what an amazing job. Uh, I'm just so skeptical about poor things. And then I, maybe it's just a point of entry. There's just something that is just mm-hmm. like I see the trailer and I go, God, this just does not look like it's for me. Like, like mm-hmm. nothing about this movie says that I want to watch this. But I, it seems to be like an eccentric story that's very meta. Yeah, I, I and I agree with you. It's. It's going to be a hard sell for me on poor things. But as you're again, if you're watching us on YouTube, we have a graphic here of some of the uh, National Board of Review honorees. And we see that under the under poor things, we have best adapted screenplay. Um, It was honored as one of the top films. And it was also given uh, best supporting actor with Mark Ruffalo in the film as well. Um, So there's definitely a lot of 
a lot of like going for something is going for poor things. Uh, but I agree with you. The trailer is not doing it. But Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, again, we we've discussed this in a previous episode. Not our favorite film. Again, we talk about the whole meal. I don't. I think we can both agree that the Killers of the Flower Moon is not quite that. But I can agree with you that Lily Gladstone is for Best Actress is going to be hard to beat without knowing who the other uh, contenders are when it comes to other award shows. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so moving on, we are going to move on to the AFI Awards. AFI Awards 2023 honorees have been announced. The American Film Institute honorees include 10 outstanding films and 10 outstanding TV programs deemed culturally and artistically representative of this year's most significant achievements in the art of the moving image. Movies include of the year include American Fiction, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, May December, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, and Spider Man Across the Universe. I think this is a this is a great list. I mean, all of these there's a few I think there's two, three of these full four that we haven't seen. <laughs> Uh, uh one two three yep you're yeah. right yep american that being american fiction uh may december uh poor things and maestro did i say maestro i think i said maestro the last time it's maestro it's maestro it's okay <laughs> it's maestro yeah I'm, I'm trying i'm trying to throw like some tang in there and it's like it's <laughs> maestro you're, you're trying to <laughs> maestro, maestro. <laughs> like you're, you're you're trying too hard. <laughs> Just read it how it is. Just read the words, Matthew. <laughs> Maestro. Um, what's What's interesting? Uh, can you? Uh, I'm not sure if you can. Can you go back to the other slide? Uh, is that a thing? Yeah, I can go back to the, if, the National Border Review. The National Border Review. Yeah. Sure, Matthew. Let's do it. I, I, <laughs> um, I I do find it interesting that some movies are not in the uh, American. Uh, the American Film Institute honorees. Like, we see some crossover, like with Barbie and Oppenheimer and the holdovers, but then there's like some that, like, The Boar and the Heron made the National Border Review, but not in the, um, on the, the American Film Institute. But then we have May December, which is also being talked about highly, mm. uh, that made it to the American, um, American Film Institute, but is nowhere to be seen in the national border review. I just find it interesting that there have been a lot of films that have been in the conversation and ones that we're trying to get to and trying to hone in on what be, might be nominated for best picture. And there's some here, like for example, the iron claw, we were talking about this before we were started recording how that one is, is being looked at, but not potentially for best picture, but now it's saying otherwise. And then you look at the American film Institute and iron claw is nowhere to be seen. Yeah. Um, Which is one I'm it's looking also forward noted. to. I'm actually looking forward to that. The A24 new film with Zac Efron and uh, mm -hmm. Jeremy. And I think what's really drawing me to it even more so than Zac Efron is Jeremy Allen White. Just based on, mm -hmm. like, I've been watching him since he was on Shameless, which is a show, mm -hmm. which is a show on Showtime, which lasted nine, ten seasons. He did that whole run. Yeah. Um, and he's just, he's just so good in everything he's in. He's just a fantastic actor. So... I, I'm here for I'm here for I'm here for whatever project he's about, and that's supposed to be a fantastic film. So, and it, I mean, mm -hmm. and that's like with any of these, like even whether it's yeah. National Board or it's AFI, like you know, everything is just subjective to the person. It is, but it's so interesting to see where the major crossover is, and we and you know, yeah, and for the most part, we seem to hit them. Like you know, Poor Things is being talked about. Past Lives is another one that. I mean, mm -hmm. we we reviewed it almost. It was it in the summer. It couldn't have been. Was it summer or? No, I think it was a, just a few weeks ago. Not like that much longer, but um, let's see. When, when like did we review it was a long. One? It was a long time ago. <laughs> no, not that long. I don't, I'm, at least I don't think it was. <laughs> uh, we reviewed it uh, episode one ninety. So end of October. Mm. Ah, that was a long so time not, ago. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. We're we're just ahead of the times right yeah, now. We're, we're 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 getting it done. Trying, dude. You know, and that's it seems to be our goal every year. So just try to mm -hmm. not be caught up in all the 
and like when the Oscar nominations drop, I don't, I just don't want to play that much catch up because we, we, we yeah. already have to, you already have to do your detective work when you want to, I know when we have, we want to watch the shorts or find the documentaries. You're like, here, you got to go to this link. You got to knock three <laughs> times. You've got to open the link in exactly 35 <laughs> seconds and make sure you watch it between this time and this time when the sun is setting just over the east side of the hill. It's like, it's like, oh, it's like you always find the most random way to watch it i think there was a weird short you know you already know what i'm gonna say there were there was a weird short that was not available in this country and matt did his investigative work and he's like you're gonna go to this youtube link that's a video of this person watching the short (laughs) that is the way that is the only way we can watch this before it airs in the oscars (laughs) It was so weird. I fa- like I said, I found it on YouTube, and it was someone filming their phone. Yes. Yes. I I believe I could be wrong, but I think they were watching it on a plane, <laughs> and <laughs> and I was like, what? And then I think it was also like in two parts. Yes. Like it was like a fifteen minute video in two yes. parts, and it's like I think I think this is it. And then and then you know we. We 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 watched it that way, and I was like, and we've talked about this before, and I'm sure we'll talk about this again come Oscar season. But it's like, just make it available. Why why are you trying this like, hard? Seriously, you guys want to make money? Offer a package to people who are willing yeah. to pay, and say, hey, here's all the shit. Here's all the random shit that's going to be up during the Oscars, and here you can mm-hmm. you can come to our site and stream it here. You can pay per video. You can buy a package that has all of them in one. And like a lot of people would jump onto that. Like I think so. It would just be a lot easier for all yes, of us. Yes, like to keep we it that like way. we want to engage in your show. Sorry, let I mean yeah. I need to get let yeah, me, I need to get off my soapbox. I already, I already felt myself rising. Either way, uh, these are the yeah, pictures. Let's, let's get back. To, let's talk about the TV. Yeah, let's, let's talk about TV. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's just stay here for a minute. Stay here. I, I just want to make a note um, that Spider Man was both here at the um, American Film Institute Awards as well as the National Board. A one for best animated feature. So I think on that regard. Again, it's showing it's showing that it has a better standing at the Oscars now that out of all the animated movies that are being looked at, Spider-Man is the one that's getting the awards and being honored and not, say, Elemental or Wish or Boy and the Heron. So, um, it again, these are these are the small awards that help us paint what's going to be either nominated or what's being looked at for, like, best picture and giving us the best ideas when it comes to our Oscars prediction episode of uh, who will win. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So with that, like you said, let's move over to television. Uh, Television programs of the year, we have Avid Elementary, The Bear, Beef, Jury Duty, The Last of Us, The Morning Show, uh, Only Murderers in the Building, Poker Face, Reservation Dogs, and Succession. As we can tell from the, um, for the Critics' Choice Awards, um, we've seen some similarities here. Almost every show was mentioned from the Critics' Choice, with the exception of Only Murderers in the Building and Jury Duty. And uh, Jury Duty was hilarious. Yeah. I'm happy to see that that film up there. I had a great time watching that. That's that's that is that is different television. Um, it's like scripted and reality. It was fantastic. Um, I never really got past the first seasons of Only Murderers in the Building, but I, I guess the show is still doing well. Um, but yeah, another interesting category of all the be- the good shows that came out of 2023, and most of them, I would say, that collectively we've seen. Yeah, I think the one that's interesting. I never got a chance to see Jury Duty, but I think just the f- just so interesting that it's even made it to this list. I mean, this is a show mm-hmm. that's on freebie. Like, yeah, like a free sh- and this is a free streaming site and they just give it to you. Mm-hmm. Very. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think I mean, I, I none of these shows are not worthy of this list. So, uh, yeah, I think this is all I, I, I guess this is the best of television we have to offer. Funny enough, Loki's not on there. Star Trek's not on there, um, among other shows. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm not mad at this list. Um the American 
Film Institute Awards selections are made through a jury process where um, AFI in tr uh, trustees, artists, critics, and scholars determine the year's most outstanding achievements and provide artistic and cultural context for the selection of each honoree. The AFI Award celebrates film and television arts collaborative nature and is the only national program that honors creative teams as a whole, recognizing those in front and behind the camera. Well, so. Maybe to know. respect that. I'm all for that. <laughs> I mean, people Absolutely. behind the camera are equally as important as the people in front of the camera. Like they're the ones who make shit happen. Hey, they, they, they I mean, yes, they, the, the actors and everything in front of the camera is what you see, but there is, you, you know, like credits that, that you kind of skip over after or walk every out show. Of during the end Those of the movie. Are the I mean, we all do or it. I'm not saying it judgmentally. <laughs> I'm just saying it's like, like that is something that a lot of people do. Like a lot of people don't don't watch mm -hmm. all the credits unless there's a cutscene, and I, I've yeah. done it. I mean, I've walked out during the credits, but mm -hmm. I mean, the people. I mean, it's long because that's that's the amount of that's the huge team it takes to put these productions together. Absolutely, um, but yeah. So those are all of the awards. Uh, news we have for you this week. Uh, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg here, yeah. Ernesto, on a lot of the different award shows we're going to be covering, a lot of the honorees that's going to be happening, a lot of the best pictures, a lot of a lot of people putting their two cents on what they deem as the best movies, collection of best movies and TV. And this is just the start of it. In the, in the, toward the end of the year, as well as next year, this is going to be a lot of the conversation moving forward. Absolutely. But this next piece of news, Matt... I am extremely, extremely excited for. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery has signed a multi-year U.S. output deal with A24, bringing the A, bringing the entertainment company's slate of films exclusively to Max after their theatrical run. A24's output agreement with WB Discovery comes after the expiration of A24's deal earlier this year with Paramount Global's Showtime, originally struck in 2019. Among the films to be available under the new deal are Sofia Coppola's biopic Priscilla, which I'm actually going to talk about in my What You're Watching later, uh, Dream Scenario starring Nicolas Cage, and The Iron Claw starring Zac Efron and Jeremy Allen White. In addition, the two companies extended their licensing deal for A24's libraries of, of movies on HBO and Max, which will encompass more than 100 titles over the term of the agreement, which include award-winning films like Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, The Whale, Uncut Gems, and Past Lives. I actually, I, I must have missed. I didn't realize that Uncut Gems was an A24 film. And, I mean, mm -hmm. that was a that was an absolutely fantastic movie. I mean, this is good. This is great news. I've always said that Max is, you know, they they know they there's a lot of value in that streaming service. Mm -hmm. It it is more costly than the others, but man, do they have a lot of quality content on there? Yeah, I will say that this is a and Max because aside from Warner Brothers and like they needed more a variety of films other than the Warner Brothers catalog category. And I think having a 24 on there, I'm assuming at some point of next year, the deal will probably be happening. Um, but like it will come into effect because yeah, I remember that most of A twenty four films um, are available on uh, on Showtime right now. And then if you have Paramount Plus with Showtime, then you can find all those movies there. So I'm assuming eventually, within the next couple of months, we'll see all those movies being taken away and putting it on Max, which is a more sought out streaming service. So I think for A twenty four, this is a better deal for having more people have access to their movies because I, I believe more people would have Max than they would Paramount Plus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you're gonna be talking about Priscilla later on in the in this episode. I'm gonna be talking about Dream Scenario later on in this episode. Just more teases being thrown out there. Um, and we were just talking about Iron Claw. I don't know when. I they, we don't know when these movies are coming yeah. to Max. They might be. They might be pretty strict. It could be within three months. It could be within six months. And I guess it all depends on what the deal is. Um, in my opinion, I hope it's sooner rather than later because I don't mind seeing these new releases on Max sooner. But hey, I I respect the theatrical. I'm down release. for you know maybe 45. Actually, no, no. I you know so, yeah, it so. needs to have its theatrical run. At least I'm gonna say it should at least be 90. We should at least go 90. Give it 90, three months. Um, yeah, give it three months in it. Give it three give months it in months. the theater. Yeah, yeah. So we gotta show love to the theater still. Perfect. 
or, or you know, give it a month and a half in the theaters, and then when that's run, running low, then you put it out oh, on the VOD market. True. You know, have people rent it and buy it, and then from there, within the three months, then we put it on Max. Look, we're not telling you how to do your job, Warner Brothers, but just saying that that's 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 Here's works for nugget. us. There you go. <laughs> it's a nugget. <laughs> Uh, but I agree with you. A24 signing with Warner Brothers is a good deal. I think that this definitely helps with the Mac streaming service um, because I do feel like that they don't have as they're not coming out with the original movies on there as much as they used to. It's sticking with the HBO shows and a lot of documentaries um, and then the reality shows that Discovery kind of come out with. But yeah, either way, A24, I think I think it's a good deal all around for everybody Absolutely. on that deal. I think they made Absolutely. a better deal there. Uh, moving on from that, Michael Waldron, the creator of Loki and writer of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, has been hired to write Avengers the Kang Dynasty. Waldron will now write both Avengers the Kang Dynasty and Avengers Secret Wars. Jeff Lovel- Loveness, writer of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, was previously attached to write Avengers the Kang Dynasty, but has been quietly let go from the project. Jonna Robinson, who wrote the book MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, uh, said on a podcast that Loveness was no longer working with Marvel due to him being, quote, wrapped up in his in their initial approach of Kang. Loveness has has written a draft of the script, but it's unclear how much of it will be used. Um, just making a note on the book, The MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, I just got that. Um, on an audiobook form, so I'll be listening to that very soon. Very, I heard a lot of good things about it. Um, the the audiobook said it's 17 hours long, so I was like, oh my god, that's a very long book. Interesting. Uh, as far as, uh, but yeah, go go look into it. I just got it from the library, so I have three weeks to listen to it. So I'm going to be diving it into it into uh, tomorrow, most likely. And if that, anything good comes out of it, yeah, I'll absolutely. You know. I'm very, I'm very, um, I'm interested to hear to hear about that. Uh, but at least pertaining to the news of Michael Waldron, I don't think that any of this comes as a surprise. No, and I think <laughs> – I mean I think that the big question is – so obviously it's probably not going to be called the Kang Dynasty anymore. And that that's clear. It's very yeah. clear that there – that whatever happened in Loki and I haven't been able to finish it, but you've alluded to that they've closed the door on – they've softly closed the door on Kang for either for now mm-hmm. or for forever like they like they've made mm-hmm. it to a point where it's taken care of like it does not it, it should not yes. come back um or it doesn't yeah. need to for an immediate yeah future. like a, get, but gave it an ending so that you know it's not it's a loose end that's now been tied up yeah and but easy door is like i would say close a jar it can easily be reopened it's mm. like it's like you close the door but you didn't lock it yeah Let's put it that way. So you can easily open it if you want to, but it's not going to be a struggle. Uh, but you don't need to open that door if you don't want to. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I, I like what he's done with Loki. I think Loki is fantastic. I'm I'm all in on this second season. You know, granted, I have to wait for uh, my wife and my son, for the three of us to come together because we're the ones who like to watch it. We have to wait for them to come together for us to watch. So it takes a while for us to get through certain projects. As I've, as I've talked about on mm-hmm. other episodes before which is whatever it's fine there's a lot of other stuff to watch and it's obviously not going anywhere and mm-hmm. uh, you know and i'm not here for the week to week i'd rather wait till it's all dropped and then be able to binge it it just just makes it easier to fit into my life schedule but this is this is fantastic news this is obviously a part of the whole course correction that marvels yeah. we've seen many different things come out over the past months and uh then this is just one of them and i'm i'm kind of here for it uh, i'm glad to see that they're correcting shit and like that they've taken they've taken our words as fans seriously i mean we've even talked about when we when, when we reviewed quantum mania before that whole variety article dropped that that mm-hmm. something needed to change at marvel that we needed to stop making excuses for them and yeah i'm, I'm here for it i mean i'm here for the course correction yeah, and and there's two things I like about this. One that I was really, really, really enjoyed uh, Loki season two, prime specifically its finale. So the fact that it ended so strong and it came from uh, from this person here, I think he he was.
already a great show like because then at that point are the the worry is that you're going to dilute what yeah. is already there but if you're making it better or just expanding on it in a way that like you can watch this or that and actually works really well then let's let's keep this coming i would just the only avocado i say to that is like the walking dead is an example of you starting all these different shows and it's not really resonating and then it diluted what the walking dead True. was so True. So now you're already like you can maybe balance one or two shows, but now you're potentially starting a third show outside of the animated series that you're already doing. So as first and foremost, as long as you can get the story down and it's compelling enough that warrants this and add something to the universe, I'm here for it. But please do not dilute what's already great about this franchise. That is a fantastic point. And uh, yeah, I mean, I got nothing else. I got nothing else. I mean, that you pretty much hit the nail on the head. <laughs> There you go. Um, but last but certainly not least in the piece of news we have for you guys this week, um, I want to talk about a statement that Ryan Reynolds posted on social media regarding the recent photos that have been leaked online from the set of the upcoming Deadpool 3 film and asking fans not to spoil the movie by posting those links. And I think his statement is a great reminder of preserving the joy of going to the movies and watching a movie for the first time in theaters uh i i that it that we th this should be talked about more in my opinion and here's the statement that he said is that in the statement he said surprises are part of the magic of the theatrical movies it's important for us to shoot the new deadpool film in real natural environments using practical effects as opposed to making the movie indoors and digitally telephoto lenses continue to spoil surprises and create a difficult situation for everyone here's hoping here's hoping some of the websites and social channels hold back on showing images before they're ready the film is built for audience joy and our highest hope is to preserve as much of that magic as possible for the finished film and the big screen. Part of the reason people post spoilers is because they're excited. I realize there, these aren't real world issues and it's firmly in the quote, good problems bucket. I love making this movie. Mm. I think that's a, that's a great message. I think it's mm -hmm. so warranted and it. Yeah. You know, some of it is being excited, but I, th I just think we need to, people who do that, like, let's talk about other things. Like, like mm -hmm. we can be excited for things, but we don't have to, and he's right. Like, why are we spoiling things? This is, it's the same yeah. reason why, the same reason why I don't like to watch trailers, especially for something yeah. that I know that I'm going to watch because then all the surprises are in the movie. I got it. I'm getting it exactly how the creators intended it. Not for anything to be spoiled. I'm, I mean, I'm here for it. I'm all for going blind. I don't need to see set photos. I, you know, like I wish, I wish I never would have saw yeah. the set photo with the 20th century Fox thing in the background. What a great joke that would have mm. been as a reveal when yeah. the, when the film came out. Right. Like granted. Yeah, it's cool. We Absolutely. got to now. And you know, we would have gotten the reveal of Wolverine in the yellow suit. Like all of that would have been great to see on film. Like we haven't even gotten a trailer yet and we already have a lot of information of things that are happening. Yeah, and 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 you're right, and and if they wanted to post that, I mean, I would give a pass for the, um, for like them, like they announced that Deadpool, sorry, that Hugh Jackman was going to be in the movie. Yeah, like that. That's that's a selling point. That that's the thing that makes you want to go watch, you know, the movie. So like, I get that. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot, and especially when it came down to like some of the bigger movies, like Spider Man, No, uh, No Way Home. And like a lot of the big action, like especially pertaining to blockbusters, like having leaked sect photos. Yeah, you're right. It just it ruins the surprise of what it is. And especially like we especially when it comes down closer, the last trailer that they announced, it gives too much away. Yeah. And sometimes sometimes that's the fault of the studio. But other time, remember that. Remember, let's go. Sorry, I'm, my head's all over the place because I'm remembering things. Uh, but the uh, Shazam Fury of the Gods. Remember they 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 dropped the trailer that Wonder Woman was going to be yes. in the movie. Yes, exact same thing. And, and that that was under the studios. You know that was on them. But it doesn't stop anyone from seeing them on set and being like, oh, we think Gal Gadot is going to be in the movie because we saw her on set. And they had the same sets before. People, for going back to Spider Man No Way Home, 
they were making jokes that they saw you on the set of, of Spider-Man No Way Home. And Andrew Garfield's like, nope, wasn't there. Wasn't me. It's like he, he had to lie because he was told not to tell anybody. But as far as the like the new sites, like if, if you know that they're not supposed to talk about it, then why ask? Mm. Like it like are are these new sites at fault? Like, cause not just fans posting, it's it's these sites that are posting it. True. Like, you know, like even comic book, IGN, it's like they're doing their job. They're posting the news and what people are saying. But at the same time, it's like you're also ruining it. That that Fox logo at the background is was gonna excuse me, would have been hilarious. Yeah. Um and it if we would have And it would have still been funny because maybe they would have dropped it in the trailer, but it's like Come on, like you're like we're we're missing the we're missing the point. Like even when IGN and all them they post they post like set photos or things that have leaked. You know, another one that really really bothers me is like actor rumors before that before it's been confirmed by yeah. the studio or the actor or the director. It's like <laughs> there's so many sites online that are like, ooh, James Gunn started following this person. This person yeah. may be the new Wonder Woman. Ooh. <laughs> and i guess yes it may be fun to speculate yeah. but like you're looking real hard at this person's life to try to figure out i'm sorry not even their life you're looking at their social media following to try to piece together who's going to be this person yeah and, and it's funny because there have been there were there were news there were reports like about a month ago or at least about three weeks ago that they had the cast of the Fantastic Four. And we chose not to talk about it because like that's not official. No. I, I only I mean we can talk about the rumors, sure, but I th- what they were saying was not official. They also they also claimed that they knew who was gonna play Lex Luthor for uh, oh, for yeah. the new Superman legacy movie. I saw that. And and I was like, I didn't I didn't see this from James Gunn. Yeah. So I don't uh, until I see it I can't say I, we can't talk about it officially because it's not uh, true yet. And just specifically when it comes to James Gunn, like mm-hmm. he is he is a like one of the first ones to post about it, what's going on with his projects. So it's almost right. like like let the creators do their job. Like their job is to relay the information in how they want it related. Like I don't mm-hmm. I don't know. Like there's just so much other shit to talk about. There's just so much other things going on and so much other stuff yeah. to watch that like we don't need to spend time on this on random speculation that has not been confirmed. Uh, I, I do want to say, because uh, we're on the topic of what Ryan Reynolds had to say right before we started recording, Ryan Reynolds had more to say about uh, okay. these leaked photos. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you my phone. I'm going to put it onto the screen and try to describe it for people who are not listening. But, uh, Ryan Reynolds decided to post his own leak photos. So, uh, this right here is, uh, apparently, uh, the predator is going to be in the new Deadpool movie. And <laughs> hey, there must be some kind of action scene. Cause it looks like Wolverine and his, um, and his stunt double and uh, his stunt double. Yeah. We also have uh, looks like Mickey Mouse is uh, <laughs> going into with money bags bag full of money. <laughs> and this is on and, and see this is from Ryan Reynolds. See, like this is funny. this is from Ryan. This Reynolds, is fun. Yes. This is great. <laughs> uh, he also I don't know what this is. I, I can't really. It's before I show you. It says Deadpool begin began with a leak. So I'm joining in. Please don't overuse the phrase Deadpool leak. Okay, he's just pointing out. Um, so. This is another one. Uh, let me see. Get nope. Let's go back. Yeah, right there. There we go. Uh, I really can't tell what this is. That looks like the 20th uh, Century Fox logo. Like it looks like the it, writing it, of it. It does, but I can't tell what he's poking fun at here. Um, or maybe it's a plumbing, a one, pipe, a plumbing pipe, maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, here's another one that he posted as well. I think the <laughs> the phrase that it's being written there was. Wally lower the cue cards. That's what. <laughs> yeah, the the guy has a cue cards in the photo. It, I mean, but this is like him now. Ryan Reynolds getting to be Deadpool. Yes, this is him. This is Ryan Reynolds controlling the narrative. Absolutely, that's what he's doing. Here's the last one he posted. Uh, that is Steve Urkel dancing in the background. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, on one of the sets as well. Uh, oh wait, hold on. We got one more. Uh, gr- uh looks like uh. Oh, the, the 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 purple nugget. Grimace. From, uh, 
Grimace <laughs> from McDonald's is also in the movie as well. Who knew, who knew? that all these who knew that all these characters are going to be in here? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is Ryan Reynolds poking fun at it, um, and the I mean, this is just an example of like, look, he went to social media, and this is what I feel like more sh- people should be doing. He sincerely posted on social media, going away from his funny comedy sticks that he does all the time. Mm. He made this sincere post saying hey guys i know you're excited but please stop posting photos we really want to preserve the magic of when people see this movie for the first time and not having to see it in a in a you know in a leaked photo that was on set but then literally the next day goes but also now i'm poking fun at this because i'm ryan Reynolds. he's like let me you want to see photos well i'm, gonna, I'm about to troll the shit out of you <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway i i 100 percent I am down for what Ryan Reynolds uh, has to say. And he makes a valid point on just, you know, like maybe if you see the headline just in the future, this might not stop people from posting it, but hopefully it does. But if you do see it and it's a headline, maybe not click into it. Yeah. Let's let it scroll past. Let it, let, let it be saved. Scroll past it. And unless you have those, those new sites that just put it right on the cover. And then we Can't shake our it. finger at you and say, Bad. Just like, it's like they do the same thing when they post spoilers, like like the day after shit airs. It's like lo- yeah, it's like the day after, like seconds after the Loki finale happens. It's like here are all the memes. Here are all the memes relating to the finale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like there should be a grace period, like yes. maybe maybe three days or something. Like give people time to watch it. Social media is very like frustrating that way. Is like you know not everyone can watch it as soon as it comes out. Just give people time to watch it. Yeah. That's all I have to and say. You know, and then, then th- I was just gonna say, and those people, you know, what the argument from those people are, they don't care. <laughs> yeah, if you, that's true. If you wanted, if you wanted it, then stay off social media. If you don't want to know about it, <laughs> that's. I mean, there's also a point there, but also you, you know, just just be nice have a little about bit it. Of respect, you, you know, that's all we're saying. Um, but yeah, I think this is great from Ryan Reynolds. Um, it's pretty funny what he did with it, and hopefully, maybe new sites will back off. Um, I doubt it. So that, <laughs> well, that's the goal anyway. Yeah, exactly. Then they're 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 almost done filming, uh, so hopefully this will no longer be a problem. Um, but there you go. That's all the entertainment news we have for you guys this week. As always, you can follow us on our social media channels on Instagram at box office underscore bingers and our Facebook and thread page at box office bingers. We'll post all the all the all the entertainment news, at least most entertainment news over there first, and then we'll come over to the podcast and we'll talk about it. So with that, we have the grand return because we missed it last week of our what you're watching segment. And I'm sure after skipping it for a week and a bit and over the Thanksgiving holiday, I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I've got, I've got quite a few things. So let's, All right, here we let's go. kick it off. So first, so this is a movie I actually saw like a couple of months ago. But I guess I just forgot to tell you. <laughs> so I saw A24's Priscilla, uh, written and directed by Sofia Coppola. And man, this movie was really, really intense. It tells the story of Priscilla, uh, of a young Priscilla Blow, Blow, I think is how you pronounce her name. And her how her, she, you know, this is a very well-documented thing of her relationship with Elvis. But what you, you don't, you know, you think you're going to see Elvis from the Elvis movie last year? No, you don't get to see that Elvis. <laughs> you get to see the narcissistic Elvis that it does not, mm. it does not paint him into a, into a very great picture. Like it, it gives you a very raw realization of what it was like, to be her and how and what like what of what a lonely life she had to leave to lead while she was while she was with him um it's it was actually a really really good movie and and jacob alordi who who act who gets to portray elvis um he you can see him he was in uh, euphoria he was like the big mm. he was like the big jock in euphoria and he played his role very well um i actually thought it was a great film it, it was it's it's hard to watch like if you love elvis mm-hmm. it does not it does not paint a good picture of him um but it's obviously something i think that will possibly be in the award conversation for next year 
Yeah, and it's interesting because not a lot of buzz has been around this movie. I think Sofia Coppola has made a name for herself, so that's already something there. Um, and this is coming just one year after the Elvis film that was nominated for Best Picture. Um, so now seeing like a different version, when Priscilla wasn't even a main character in the Elvis movie, now we're flipping the script here and maybe getting her side of the story, at least portrayed in this film, on some of the other aspects we didn't see from the Elvis film. So um, I don't think I'll go to the theaters and watch this, but we just talked about it being on Mac, so maybe when it hits that, I'll probably check it out. And the one, the one other thing I will say is that I love that the movie is like it. There's almost like no clear start and beginning. Like there's no mm. like overarching arc. Like it's just like this is, this is the life that she lived. You're almost like a window in time. Like the movie just like it. And at one point, it just ends. You're like, mm. oh, okay. I guess I guess it ends. Um, yeah. But it it was great. I think um it's it's definitely at least worth the watch especially if you're a big elvis fan uh moving on matt i finished Mm. yep for those who are just for those who are also watching along uh i i finished the wife and i finished the fall of the house of usher mike flanagan's work on netflix and uh chef's kiss in oh fucking incredible what yeah. incredible writing like seriously like I, I i can't believe this show is as good as it is just yeah. the amount of detail they put into it just the amount of care they put into crafting the story just the way they were able to show things to you and it i don't want to give too much away but for me there is a there's a person who meets their demise in the finale and it's even detailed as like a very hard death to to come across for this person to give to this other as i guess the the character death i guess that's what we'll call her or like the angel of death whatever whatever we want to call her Mm -hmm. she has to she has to issue out a death to someone and it's it's such a heart-wrenching scene when she does this because Mm -hmm. like you just the way she has to explain it to her and just the way it fit into the narrative and and what it meant like she it was such an earned moment for this character that i was in tears i thought it was absolutely fantastic and and to to go off that particular scene i i i was even thinking about that in the in the show like when the finale was happening it's like i think the rules like I don't know, like, is is this is this character getting skated by? Because the rules say, and then when it came down to it, I was like, okay, all right, we we addressed it, and it was done so wonderfully, so like so beautifully written. It's and it, you're right, it is heart wrenching when it comes down to that moment uh, compared to everybody else that was in this show and like how they treated themselves and how this particular character treated herself. Yeah, it was it was just it was beautifully done. Like I. Uh, like literally it ended and we were both just in awe like like yeah. wow like that was absolutely incredible <laughs> I, I know in a couple of weeks we are probably going to be diving into the best of 2023. And I, for me, as an early, you know, to early talking about this, I feel like this is up there for me. This show being one of the best shows I've seen this year. Absolutely. And it's a sh- it's a shame that like we were just going over some of the best shows from the American film Institute and the national board and the critics choice. Like again, Mike Flanagan's name is not in the conversation. He very much should 100%. be. He absolutely should be it's like, but uh, you know, it's it, it is haunting. Like his, it, like it mm-hmm. is true horror. Like he, like he, he yeah. gets you scared. And then, I don't know. Maybe that's just it's too. Maybe this the fact of horror or being scared while you're watching the content while you're still also trying to feel something. Like maybe that maybe that's a point of entry for some people. Like you know, because I know people who love watching like really good content but won't watch this because they said, "Well, I don't because it's, it's horror. horror. Like I don't really do scary." But it's like, right. but it's so much more than that. And I think, but even yeah. to a certain extent, before we started doing this, you were the same way. Like horror, was. horror was just a point of entry. You're like, oh, I'm not really into horror, but like horror is so much more than the scares. And you know what's funny? You know what got? You know what was my entry? Mike, Mike Flanagan. Flanagan. <laughs> That's right, Mike Flanagan. <laughs> he because you told me to go watch Hill House, 
And I was like, I don't do horror. And you like, give it a shot. And I did. And I was like, oh, if this is what horror is, I can get used to this. And now like three, you know, three ish years later, here we are. And I've seen so much horror content within the last three years. And I make it a point that in September and October, I try to see more just to catch myself up on some of the, you know, the, the, the things that happened um, in over the years of horror. Um, and, and I've told you, I got caught myself up with like the Jason, Jason franchise and the Halloween, well, less of the Halloween franchise, uh, Chucky most recently, um, you know, and I'm, I'm getting myself familiar with these as well as getting some other ones out of the way. So, yeah, the, I just watched the thing not too long ago, and that was fantastic. So, like, yeah, I, 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 I give credit a hundred percent to Mike Flanagan for getting me into this, and then also getting me into the House of Fall the Usher. It was fantastic, uh, best, best television I've seen all year. Seriously, I, I can't. Like, it's so yeah, good. Really, um, is. what I'm really looking forward to. I mean, granted, his contract with Netflix is over. What now that mm-hmm. he's got that Jeff Bezos Amazon Prime money? What he's going to be bringing, yeah. what he's going to be bringing over to Prime Video, so I'm very interested interested to see what he has next in store. Because that, what a beautiful exit for Netflix! Like, like mm-hmm. okay, like it's almost it's literally like a masterpiece. Like it's so good. Like I would easily watch. Really I would did. easily watch this entire series over and over again. I, I'm I would rave. I would rave about it all forever. It's so good. And it's funny because the way I see this is like uh, Netflix is like, hey, we're not moving forward, or uh, uh, or it was Mike Flanagan who was like, we're not going to continue. I'm moving elsewhere. And this was Mike Flanagan's being like, this is what you missed, Netflix. I'm wow. out. And, My gift to you. And like, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, so yeah, what a what a fantastic show. I'm glad you were able to finish it because it, it ended on such a high Absolutely. note. It's all about the ending, Ernesto. When you stick the landing. On an already great show, it just makes it so much more worth your time. Damn, did they stick the stick the landing? And then this show is obviously inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, and the way that Mm -hmm. they gave you that poem at the end of the at the end of the series of the end of the season was phenomenal. Like it was just so beautifully crafted. Like between the camera work and the the and even the the use of sound during that period, it was absolutely absolutely incredible um highly recommend mm-hmm. you absolutely you absolutely should watch the show if you have not uh moving on i have i have more matthew i have more for you look at that um i started gen v on amazon prime oh yes uh which is this which we were talking about the boy spinoff show before and this show is also fantastic for the just for even just for the simple fact that you don't i don't feel the necessity to watch the boys to understand anything that's happening in this series. It's 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 its own self-contained story within the boys universe. You have echoes, they give you brief glimpses of things that are happening, but it is its own self-contained story. And what Gen V is really doing well is I think um Christina Watkins, friend of friend of the show, she she was she meant she kind of briefed me. She's like, this show really hits mental health. Um, just mm. through through what each of these characters are going through, and I can one hundred percent see it. Um, there is something. Um, there's a big ending to episode one. I don't want to give it away because it's still this show is still fairly recent, but there's something yeah. major that happens at the end of the season, at the end of the episode, and it's like we're trying to figure out what what this how why did this thing happen. And you get this exploration through the mental state of all these different characters and how they're dealing with their powers and what has happened to them in their past life and how it affects them. It's it's absolutely it's fantastic. And and it's almost it's like deeper than the boys. So, you know, like the, yeah, the story really for Gen V is way deeper than the boys. Um, what, I'm all in. What I like about the boys is what I like about Gen V is that I feel like it. it it gives a different perspective in this to this world. So like it, for the past three seasons of the boys, you have the corruption of Vought and you have the boys trying to yeah. stop them. And then this show comes around and it's like, it's about none of that. It's about these kids and them discovering they their powers and how to control it. And it's a much different show than what we're used to, but it also brings in all of the gory violence, the ridiculousness that the boys brings. And so it's a, it's a good marriage of like giving us something new, but also something very familiar. Yes, like this is exactly what 
it, like franchise this is gen v is a perfect example of what um franchise of what franchised content needs to be like it needs to be mm-hmm. it needs to echo in the universe it doesn't need to be a direct link now granted they have um said that the end of gen v will lead into the next season of the boys but but right. my take is that they will reference that in the beginning like what you need to know will be referenced when you watch the next season of the boys and honestly, this reminds me a little bit of early Marvel. Mm. It's like, and to some degree, you need to watch all the movies to watch the Avengers movie, but it helped if Correct. you did. It gave you better context. Um, it gave you better context, yes. Yeah, so, and it's like, and also Guardians is a great example of like, like Guardians before Infinity War was living in its own universe, literally. Um, and it was in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it had no ties to the other movies, so you can enjoy it for what it is. Or if you watch all of it, then you can get better and more content or context for the other projects that are happening. So, yeah, this is all good. How far are you? Um, we are maybe three episodes in. I mean, we're going we're going through them pretty quick, but, you know. Okay. <laughs> I. Let me know. You might get there next week, but let me know when you get to. And I'm all. I'm. I'm only gonna say this: the whole truth. Let me know when you get there. Um. Okay. <laughs> well, that was an ominous. I'm gonna tell you the whole truth. It's for me when you get there, and I know you know when you'll get mm. there. It was some of the funniest stuff I've seen. Okay. In this. Okay. Show. All right. All right. I'm here for it. So. Like. I mean, there's some great character work that happens in this season, so I'm, I'm, I'm fully all in for what's for what's coming next. Uh, I look forward to finishing it because I want to have a deeper conversation on some things that happen later in the season. Matthew, you're teasing me now. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> all right. Uh, fine. Uh, one, my final thing I'm watching is Tokyo Vice on Max. So, yeah, oh, so wow. I'm, uh, Matt Klesnick, friend of the show, who will be on mm. next week for the Boy and the Heron. Um, he was talking, and he's he highly recommend he highly recommended this show. It's American crime drama. Um, it's based on the book with the same name by Jake Adelstein, which is um, this this uh, Ansel Elgort, the main the main lead. Uh, him and Ken yeah. Watanabe. Um, it's based off of his life. Uh, he was a reporter in Tokyo, and he gets oh. mixed up with the. Um, with the yakuza and it's all about their intertwinement and like just a crime drama unfolding from unfolding from there and it's loosely i don't know what's true and what's not just looking online it says it's loosely based on his first-hand account hmm. the series follows a young american jo- journalist named jake adelstein as he descends into the underbelly of the 1990s tokyo where he worked as a reporter for a large newspaper in japan and he just like through him working through this newspaper, he gets thrown into this. He gets thrown into this world, and it's. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's a fantastic. It was. It's a fantastic story. I'm about. There's eight episodes. I'm about six in. I think I have about. I think I have two left, and it's great. It's a great series. Okay. Um. Yeah. It came out last year. I was curious if it got a second season, and it did. Um, uh, it's the second season will premiere in 2024. Um, yeah, I remember hearing some rumblings about it last year. So, um, yeah, it's good. interesting to hear that it's good. You know, it's just see, and this is one of those that I was like, all right, you know, let me just roll the dice and let me just start watching yeah. it and that, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm almost done with that. I should be done with that fairly soon. I feel like it's also one of those shows that like with amongst of a plethora of other shows that come out throughout the year, this is one of the shows you missed. And because you're already into the new year and you're focusing on the next show, you forget about some of the other shows that came out in years past. So this is one of those shows you kind of go back and like, Oh, you know what? This is actually pretty good. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Look look at that. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, and that's all I got. Okay. Um, so yeah, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, Spider-Man. Right before the holiday break, uh, right before the Thanksgiving holiday break, uh, I had the privilege of watching Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse live in concert That's incredible. right here in Orlando, the Dr. Phillips Center. I will say this because I don't think Megan knew what she was in for. <laughs> she thought that – so what this is is that they play the movie and all the music you hear in – all the music you hear from the movie is being performed live. So you basically you're hearing a live score – of it um 
you're, you're hearing a live version through through the music from from the movie, and there and so Megan thought because a couple of years ago we saw Pixar live right here the Doctor Phillips and it was just a collection of Pixar movies mm. being for, like the music being performed live so they played like a scene from Up and you're hearing the score they play a scene from like Wally and the Incredibles and you hear the score from there and then so the movie starting is like she goes oh that's interesting they found the logo the the Sony logo and then the movie's playing and she, and then she turns over and she goes when does uh are they are they playing the whole movie? When are they going to go to the live action Spider Man's? And I said, "No, Megan, this is the it's the whole movie." She goes, "Oh, we're listening to the whole movie." Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, and and I will say this: I will say that the first half, because I had an intermission, uh, the first half was, I w- I don't want to use the word boring because it was cool, but you're being wrapped up into the story mm. and the music is not supposed to be standing out when you watch a movie. So it's blending in. So like as much as you want to watch the movie, I pay to hear this music live. Yeah. And, and like, it's just being subtle enough where it's just complimenting the movie. And I'm like, I really want to appreciate everything that you guys are doing down on the stage, but it's not much happening down here. I'm now vo- focusing back on the movie again. <laughs> Um, so anyway, but where it really shined was when, uh, we got to the action of the finale and then the credits, they, they muted the, the, I think like they have the post Malone song Mm. playing at the end of the movie when the credits are rolling, they muted that and they gave us like an, like an overscore of like some of the best hits of throughout the credits. And to me, that was worth, that's when you really got to hear this shine. (laughs) And I was like, now we're talking. Because literally in an intermission, Megan goes, it's like, how much stuff in this movie? It's like, it's about 45 minutes. Like, okay, all right. All right. And like, and, and I understand where she's coming from. I was like, I get it. It might not be everyone's thing. You've seen a movie you're already watching. You're just hearing the music live. But they're doing such a good job. It blends in very well. Like, no one's missing a beat. And I'm sure that maybe, I don't know. I can't speak for that for sure. But like, I'm sure that there's a, a point where maybe some of it wasn't live. I, it's hard to tell. <laughs> You really, you really don't know. Like you can tell that there are some elements in the movie that that was clearly not featured on stage. <laughs> like you would hear a sound is like I don't, I don't see any of those instruments on stage. So that that ain't. <laughs> it's like where's that instrument? I don't see that shit there. <laughs> Liars. <laughs> but you know uh, what? Good for weird. her. It's like because you know her. She's asking you because you're like, you're looking at her. It's one of those like when you're showing somebody something that you really love and they really don't yeah. care. They don't. They could just give two shits about it. But only there yeah. because for you. And then you're like, yeah. like, isn't this great? And you you keep doing like the look over <laughs> to make sure they're they're okay. <laughs> yeah, I I don't. I want to I want to play a clip because I think it's cool. I just don't want to get flagged again uh, because we keep playing music. I'll I'll play a, a small bit of it. Uh, just, just for you to get the scope of it. I'm trying to go through my phone right now so uh, we can hear it. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to play a small bit of it. Is this thing? Right here. And there's a live DJ there, too, so he's actually doing that. Oh, that's awesome. All right. And so, yeah, that, that's so there. So there's that. It was just just a little taste of it. It was really cool, especially when the credits were rolling, that they were just able to be free with it. Um, this is a traveling orchestra. So they do this in other parts of the country as well. And it was also noted that this was an all female orchestra that was out there, with the exception of the DJ. I forgot what they called him, but it was a fun name, DJ something. Um, and um, but, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself watching the movie with a live music especially because i love the score and i was like i think this would be really cool live and what's uh, what's also cool uh was that th- this was supposed to happen in august and it was only supposed to be one showing of it and it was sold out and then we had a scare of the hurricane there was a hurricane that was about to come in and because of that they canceled that showing because it was th- the hurricane was going to be over it end up the hurricane not end up being that bad so instead of like they they end up moving the date from August to November, and then they added a second show. Mm. So Megan and I were able to catch the second show uh, because most of the tickets that were in for the for the canceled first show went to the first night. So we caught on the second night. So 
I was happy to see that we were able to catch this and uh, the schedules worked out. And so, yeah, that's it wasn't TV, but, you know, more or less, it's the same thing. It's an experience when watching a movie. Um, I wish I was able to see more movies. I think the only other time I would want to do this is for Back to the Future. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah. And I've done this once before with Indiana Jones, and that was cool, too. But I saw it at Jacksonville, and I'm going to tell you what, Jacksonville's uh, theater is nothing compared to Orlando. Mm. So <laughs> it was a, it was lot, a lot smaller. smaller. Okay, okay. This was in yes. the main Dr. Phillips Theater? Because I know they've got like the uh, like a smaller like a smaller theater. Yeah, this oh, is cool. the main one. All right. Yeah. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So we did that. We saw that. Um, and then we I wrapped up with Barry. Barry season four. Um, last time we spoke within our What You Watching segment, I told you and Hannah that I watched Barry one, two, seasons one, two, and three. And I completed this series in mm. four days. Like from season one to season four, it took me four days to do it. I basically watched a season a day, which... I mean, if you think about it, they're only 30 minutes long and they're eight episodes. So it was about four hours of my day watching this show um, when there's nothing else going on. I just went through it. And I will say this. I finished this before Thanksgiving. And a lot of the stuff is a little bit of a blur to me because I watched it within four days. I mean, this show came out in 2019, 2018. You didn't get a chance to sit on it like, at all. Not not a chance. It just went rolled right from one to the next. And I'm not sure if I would necessarily do that again. For me, it was just easy to do that. But I, I feel like I never had a chance to really think about it and appreciate everything the show is trying to offer. Because I was I just ingested it in such a fast mm. amount of time that when it came to it now, I'm trying to at this point, I'm trying to remember parts of the finale for season four is like, was that in season three or season four? It, to me, it's just one big show. <laughs> just one big season without. <laughs> yes. Um, but I did like the show. I thought some seasons were stronger than other for, from what I can remember. I really enjoyed, I think the first season as leading into the second season, because that was like the main thing that was like the crux of this Correct. entire show was the finale of season one. Um, into the rest of the series. I didn't think it was going to be that way. Like we were literally going to hang on to what happened at the end of season one um, throughout this entire series. The only thing I wasn't a fan of, and it's always a hit or miss for me when it comes with these, with these shows is the flash forward. Mm. And season four did that. in like the second half of the season where they flash forward and now he has the kid and, um, he's so maybe married to Sam or man, I forgot her name. Um, I already <laughs> forgot her name and I watched four fucking seasons of it. Um, and I think overall, I wish I would have given, given this show more time, but from the, what I watched, I mean, there was a going cause I thought it was really good, but, um, but I just don't think, I think it's already, I think it passed time. Mm. So I like that it's see that it's getting, it's accolades. And I think Bill Hader had done a fantastic job with this series. And I saw a couple behind the scenes of it. And there was like this motorcycle chase that was really inventive that I thought was really cool. Um, and I thought fantastic job and some, some great character development within this and his relationship he had with, um, uh, his partner. Oh, no, no. The other one. Uh, I can't remember his name. I know who you're talking about though. Yeah. You see, like again, I, I watched whole four seasons of it. I can't remember his name. Um, give me two seconds. His name is Fuchs. His name is mm. Fuchs. Played by uh, Stephen Root. Um, yeah, his, his character was also went through a whole bunch of changes as well. And you can see that through the prison. But yeah, my only thing is that I wasn't a fan of the flash forward. I think I, I never really am. Because in a way, in my opinion, you, we've been seeing something build up for so long. Only to be undercut by like a few years later. Mm. And I was like, Ugh, why? Like, y y I feel like we had a high and then we had to like adjust to this new way that they're doing this. We have to get reacquainted to the multiple years later aspect of it. And like, it took a whole episode just to get the bearings right of where everyone's been after the last few years. Um, when we were kind of running off the high, of what this show was, but anyway, um, I, I enjoyed it. Do you remember anything? from at least commenting on what I just said about the finale. I mean, I liked, I really liked the way it ended. I thought, 
I what I thought the show did well is that it and it for me it really hit the head on like what is a legacy like mm. what are the lasting legacy is because uh, spoiler alert the show ends where his son uh, is he he's watching the it's film right. about his yeah. dad yes. or he's watching the documentary about his dad and like what a way for you to leave a legacy to your son and like what your son feels like how he should be and like how Barry felt so alone going through what he went through in the military and how he felt the need to overcompensate. And that I thought that was really key how he played that in the last season where he was like over almost overcompensating for be like trying to be like, like, like the typical suburb dad. Yeah. Where it's like, he's really like this stone cold killer. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I I completely forgot about the the literally the final moments of the finale yeah. with when they were showing the movie, and it was just a shitty version yes. of what his life was, and we knew that it was like a B list movie. That That's was right. what it was portraying, um, with like little to no name actors being portrayal on it, and it said loosely based on a true story, and it was an awful movie. Um, but at the end of the day, though, Barry was seen as a hero. I think That's right, and, and they and, painted and they they pinned it and, on Kusuno. Yes, they pinned it on him because, again, spoiler alert, he was the one that killed Barry mm-hmm. when he walked in. I was not see. I did not see that coming. Yes, like I was like, you, oh shit, he shot him. Oh, he <laughs> shot him. Yeah, and and the and again, wonderful editing because you made it believe that you thought that he shot himself, like he was about to commit suicide with all the stuff that was happening, and instead you hear the gunshot, and then it then it goes to Barry, and then you see the blood coming from his head. Um, and then you're like, oh, oh shit, he shot him. And then he went to jail for it. And this, uh, like, uh, like uh, that's right. That that was like the big thing about like the, when it wrapped up the whole season. Then we flash forward again, and then the kid sees the movie based off the life, and he's like, oh, my dad was a hero. When in all actuality, he was. He wasn't. See, and to me, that was to me the way they ended it. It really stuck the landing because if you go back to even the beginning of the series. Uh, Barry's whole thing, why he even joined the acting classes, because he wanted to better. He wanted a better life. He wanted mm-hmm. out of the life that he was in, and this is how he sought forward. But what what him going into that actually ended up being his undoing. And then he yep. ended up like he wanted to be an actor, so he wanted to be known. So he already wanted to leave a legacy, but now he's just not leaving the legacy uh, that he wanted. And it's a movie, and ironically, it's a movie about him that he's not even in. Right, and he's not even in. How right. ironic is that? In the beginning, he goes to be an actor, and then he it, the show ends with a movie about him that he's not even in, but it's about him. Yeah, um, but yeah, I I thought it was a I thought it was a well made show. I I yeah. think it. I would. I'm very interested to see what Bill Hader does next. He's so um, good. Be, he's another because he's so good. He's really good, and I and he was he's the 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 star and the creator and the writer of the show. He directed all of season four, um, so bravo to him. I think that I really enjoyed Barry, but I think his best work is yet to come. I agree. I agree with that. Um, moving on from that, I'm not sure. It's hit. This hit that I forgot which one we we said. Oh yes. Oh yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> uh, Genie came out on Peacock. Uh, starring Melissa McCarthy. It's a, a new holiday movie uh, from the writer of Love Actually in Notting Hill. Um, and um, Melissa McCarthy is a genie. And, yep. That was, uh, and it's a Christmas movie. Um. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a thing that you watched? It's a thing that I watched and Megan enjoyed. And I was like, really? For real? And then she's like, but it's Melissa McCarthy in it. I was like, no, I I see her in the movie. I, I get like, that. <laughs> I get no, I understand that. This was not a movie for me. Um, I think it was it was not good. It was plain and simple. It was it was not good. Like I never got a warm Christmas feeling. It was Melissa McCarthy was the only one that was acting in this movie. Everyone else was very wooden <laughs> and plain. Um like Melissa McCarthy played a genie. Why I don't know the how she became into this world was also stupid, uh, and all of a sudden it's like this guy is, who's not being a good dad at all wants to win back his family, ends up rubbing this this random, uh, you know, artifact that it was in his house that was containing a genie all these years, and that's Melissa McCarthy, and 
And guess what? It's Aladdin. Just modern day. That's what okay. it is. It's a modern day Aladdin. You're right. But different. And there's a family involved. And at the end of the day, it's like, I don't think his father, I don't think this person deserves to be back with his family. Not buying it. He's still, still not doing the right things. So, anyway, I fell asleep also watching this movie. <laughs> and then Meg, Megan had to catch me up on some of the details. He's like, no, we don't have to go back. It's fine. Um, you, you clearly yeah, love your girlfriend. Is... That's, what, that's what this yeah. movie tells me. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's funny, because I recommended it. Because I'm like, oh, I, I, actually, I didn't even see the trailer. I was like, oh, Melissa McCarthy, it's Christmas. It's on Peacock. It just came out. It's Thanksgiving. Why the hell not? Yeah. Um, and so... Yeah, it wasn't for me. This is one of the like the three new offerings that they have for Christmas movies. I know that the I know the other streaming services they have like your your Hallmark movies and like your your like your B list Christmas movies. But as far as like the main ones with notable actors, it's it's this one. There's also Dashing Through the Snow with Ludacris and Little Ray Howery. Uh, mm-hmm. That's on Disney Plus. And there's also I think which is the biggest one that's coming out this year is Candy Cane Lane with Eddie Murphy. Um, I probably will be catching that one before the end of the year uh, while we're in this season because I've, I've heard decent things about that one. Mm. So we'll see. But this one, this ain't it. This 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 one will not be in my rotation of holiday movies I go back to. Okay. Um, but I, I did watch uh, – we had a family movie night the other night, and uh, we did watch Spirited again. And that was that was also fun to watch oh, again. I gotta, You know what? I'm going to watch that again this season because that movie is fantastic. It was so good. Oh, you I, know I, what? Just a side note, we were talking about watching a movie tonight as a family. I think we're gonna watch. I think that's what, spirited. I think, I think it's gonna be spirited. I think you just. I think you just invited the spirit into. I don't know where I was going with that. But no, no, I think. No, I like. It. I think. I, like I think it. this is. I think that's what we're gonna watch. It's a musical. I mean, I yep. still. I still jam to that. Um, that Will Ferrell song. Oh, um, uh, is it the Ripples or Wanna Make a Waves or was it the? Um, uh, oh man, I. I can hear the melody. I just can't think of the words. It's uh, it's like it's like his his big. It's like a redemption song. It's hit. Oh yes, yes. It's his. Uh, wow. It's 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 almost there. Uh, it's uh, uh like a. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it, we're not trying. To uh, three three song. for five hundred. Uh, unredeemable. <laughs> Uh, 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 what is unredeemable from Spirited? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hold on. Let me give you. Let me oh, give yes, you a little taste. Un, yeah, un, yes, unredeemable. Am I unredeemable? Unredeemable. Yes. Uh, un- Can I ever overcome? All right. I don't want them to take us down, but that move, that song slaps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And also, like, Good Afternoon was also a great one that was in the beginning, like, toward the middle. Good Afternoon! Yeah, we reviewed that. That's was that last that, year? That, we, had Hada- we had Hadass on last year. That We had a good time yeah. talking. We had a good time talking about that. It, what a yeah, and freaking also, fantastic like, movie. And then, as, as, was it Waking Up in That Christmas Morning Feeling? Yes, him and, and it's him and Ryan Reynolds. What a, it was a great movie. It was, it was great. It was, yeah, I... I was very pleasant to see that a year later, it's still giving us the Christmas feels. Fantastic. A, a twist on the um, Scrooge storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was it was great. And Genie, uh, Genie was not. It's funny. Cause, <laughs> sorry? And Genie was not. <laughs> and, Genie, yeah, and Genie was not. Absolutely not. Uh, there, it's funny because I asked my sister if she had watched it because we were trying to figure out a Christmas movie to watch. And she goes, no. And I said, oh, it's Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds. She's like, oh, okay. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. She's like, oh, that's probably why I didn't watch it. And I was like, it's from the Rise of the Greatest Showman. And I go, oh, okay. Should have led with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny because one of, one of my sister's favorite movies is The Greatest Showman. And I said, it's the same songwriters. It's a musical. She's like, okay, you have my attention. I'm like, all right, press and play. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Do this. <laughs> um so yeah, so anyway, Genie ain't it. Uh, moving on from that, however, I just went to the theaters this morning and I saw Dream Scenario, uh, the Nick, the new Nicolas Cage movie from A24. And I will have to say that I was disappointed with this movie. Wow. Yeah. I didn't say that I had much expectations going in because... I didn't really look at the trailer. I saw that it had a 90% of Rotten Tomatoes. It was from A24. It starred Nicolas Cage. And I was hearing some great 
word of mouth from it. Mm. And so I was like, I think that's all I really need to know. I saw a little bit of the trailer, like toward the beginning. And I was like, Ooh, this could be interesting. And I kind of left it at that. And then I went to the theater and I saw it. And I think it was more along the lines of little expectations. I thought this movie was going to be, it was most definitely was not. (laughs) Um, And at the end of the day, it just didn't resonate with me. Like I, 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 it's weird because I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but there is a clear line of what the what the what they were going for. Um, I just don't think it landed the way that it wanted it to be. Mm. Like it's it was meant to be a comedy, and I didn't really find anything funny about this. I'm not to say that it wasn't trying to be funny, but I don't like there was there was no jokes that they were setting up for or anything. I took this more of a as a mystery, but at the end of the day, it was pretty much straightforward. Like, I was expecting a twist, and there wasn't. Mm. And so I had to take everything as face value, and I didn't like that. Um, I was I was waiting for a reason, and it was like, nope. And the, ne- the reason never came? The reason never came. <laughs> it was just, it just happened. It just, like, this is it. And this is what this movie's about. And it, it took me more than halfway to realize, like, there's no twist, is there? <laughs> this, this, this is it. Um, the movie was only an hour and a half and I, I felt like it was 30 minutes too long. <laughs> it's, it's just, it, I, I don't know. I just felt like a, a lot of it had something going for it and it had an interesting premise, but didn't, it went in a direction I wasn't expecting. Mm. And maybe that works for some people, but it didn't work for me. So there was that. Um, I'm not sure if you were planning on seeing this one or not. Uh, I had a mild interest, and now I have no interest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we again, we just talked about it. It's going to be on Max. So if you, if anyone's ever interested, I, w- I would, I would have rather waited for a Max release on this mm. than go into the theater to watch it. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk about, which is more important than this movie, is David Holmes' The Boy Who Lived, the documentary on max it is or on hbo and max um it's about david holmes who was a stunt double for uh daniel radcliffe and all the harry potter movies who got into an unfortunate accident on set while filming the harry potter and the deathly hollows and it's about his journey through like his life up until the accident and his his process that happened after the accident and kind of his new life kind of being paralyzed uh, for the rest of his life. And it is as much as heartbreaking as it is delightful. Mm. Like the movie and the documentary is so positive and you're, and you're just like, this man just lost his entire life and he has the best attitude about it. I don't know how, but he does. And like, even like when things look like it's worse, especially when it comes down to some of the, the most more recent years, because I think it comes down to like, like this year as you know, like that's how far the documentary goes of like things that are happening this year. And um, like it's it's I was glued to it the entire time. Like for those who even want to see behind the scenes on some of the Harry Potter stuff, they showed that as well. But this movie is not about harry potter it's about it's it's 100 about david holmes um and daniel radcliffe is in it and he does do interviews and um i think he's the one it says executive producer but i feel like he was also kind of leading the charge on this documentary as well um because david holmes wanted he now felt comfortable telling the story of his life and kind of kind of just being like an awareness out there and like he he feels no guilt he's like if i was able to walk again i would go back and do what i was doing before Mm. i would go back on set and start being a stunt double it's like he he is like the best of humanity and it was just such a good documentary like one of the best doctor hands down um okay i i was already really interested this is something i definitely want to check out do you do you expect the oscar buzz from this i hope so uh uh, in the few weeks, we'll see the short list of what the Oscars are looking at when it comes to documentaries. Um, I, I hope it's up there because, uh, you know, you know, the Oscars are necessary. They love, uh, you know, movies talking about movies and documentaries <laughs> about movies. Yep. And so and this is up there. This is about a stunt double who got injured on the job and kind of going through that process that he was going through, as well as, you know, bringing awareness to the safeties of when you're on set. And I if that that's right up the Oscars alley when it comes to that stuff. 
Um, so I hope it's at least being on the short list. I don't know if it will be there at the end of the day when it comes to the nominations. I don't know if it even qualifies, to be honest with you. But I hope it's there because I really enjoyed it. As as a Harry Potter fan, as a person who loved watching movies, and just I have so much more respect for the craft uh, after watching this documentary and like the amount of work you need to do to make sure that these actors are safe. And it was David Holmes who was helping Danny Radcliffe even do his own stunts. Like he was even saying that some people were like some stunt doubles were like, no, let me do it. This is my job. I don't want you to like take away my job. But David Holmes was like, you want to do this? Sure. I'll teach you how to do this. Yeah. And so there were some scenes, especially in, uh, I think the Goblet of Fire where, um, Danny Radcliffe was doing some of his own stunts. Uh, wow. with the help from David Holmes. And he's been his stunt double since Sorcerer's Stone, since the first movie. So they grew up together as much as anybody else did. Wow, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, can't, it's, it's, I can't wait to check it out. I'm, I'm it's really, looking forward to it. It's really eye-opening. I 100% recommend it, especially if you're a Harry Potter fan or involved in the movies or anything like that. It's well worth your time. Um, so anyway, that's all I've been watching. So with that, we're going to be diving into our spoiler reviews, reviews, or our spoiler <laughs> review of The Holdovers, a movie that's already being looked at highly as as being, as we already talked about, being looked at as many honorees for some of the best movies of the year. And it's a high contender for what the Oscars might be in store. Um, our supporting actress, um, what was her name? Divine, Divine, Joy Divine Joy Randolph. Randolph? Yeah, she's already won a an award. I think it was a Spirit Award. No, it was a New York's Critics Award for Best Supporting Actress. And it's already been looked at for other um, nominations as well. We just saw Paul Giamatti win for, for the National Board of Review for Best Actor. So with all that, Ernesto, your thoughts on the holdovers? Um, surprisingly, I loved this movie. Like, I... I went into it not really expecting anything at all. I, I mean, you remember we talked about it. Like, I almost, I almost like kind of wrote it off. Like, I didn't really want yeah. to see it. Like, I was like, eh, it doesn't really look like something I'm really gonna enjoy. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, and I saw this on a Tuesday afternoon, and the theater was like mostly packed. Like, granted, really? it, was, it was an older crowd. It's a oh, much older okay. crowd in a theater, but. They were all there nonetheless, and the movie was fantastic. I mean, Paul Giamatti is was absolutely a standout. Divine Joy Randolph, I mean, she was. I mean, all three of these characters really, really carried the film. And Dominic Sessa, like first time actor, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're when you're working with the great Paul Giamatti, like it, yeah. it was fantastic. I think it was he a, went toe to toe with Paul Giamatti. Seriously, yeah, like yeah. Ser- like they really, really matched each other, and I actually loved the way that they played off of each other. Like their like their chemistry on on set is absolutely fantastic. It, it like the way they were able to play off of each other really elevated what this movie. I think really elevated what the movie was giving us. Um, what what I also really like about what I really enjoy is that. Not only is it just a, a great character drama, it's also a fantastic uh, Christmas movie. Like this is one hundred percent. And I was reading an article. I think it was Hollywood Reporter was talking to the director, and it like he want that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted his he wanted this movie to seem like like somebody pulled it out of the vault. Like it actually was made in the seventies and like somebody just pulled it out of the vault. And I want, and you get the, you see that with the opening credits and just obviously the look and feel of the film. Like I think they were able to achieve that 100%. Um, you get Paul Giamatti, who's like this Scrooge like character he meets. And, and this is, this is like, this is my one small gripe though. It's maybe like 15 minutes too long. And I think we spent way too much time on all these other kids i would have mm. i would have i would have much have rather them been a, a brief mention and for their exit like when they left like that should i felt like maybe that should have happened a lot sooner and given us more time to build with paul giamani and dominic Sessa's character like build the build these two characters together and even um the cook her her character getting them all together if he had given us more of that i feel like we would this movie would have hit just a lot 
harder. I mean, the movie does a fantastic job humanizing the three of them through all three of their stories. Paul Giamatti 100%. is like a lonely Scrooge. He's like he has he has these body odor issues. Like he has a lazy eye. He has he has, and this is what Paul Giamatti I think he does really well. He always plays characters where he's like. Where like at first glance, like you just want to stay very clear of this person, but as you start to peel back the layers, you realize like how really soft hearted they are. Like a true, a true like softy on the inside and like steel trap door on the outside. But like once you break mm-hmm. through that initial barrier, you get to see like the true loving person that he is, and you get this, you get the this kid uh, Dominic Sessa. He he's you know he's he just wants to be loved like he's his mom and his his mom remarried while his dad's and it has has schizophrenia and he's in a mental institution and his mom just told him oh i'm not gonna spend christmas with you i'm yeah. going on i'm going on a honeymoon with my with my new man he's gonna be your new dad and then you get divine joy randolph's character who, who lost her son and you know he was a student at the school but he lost himself trying to trying to earn money, trying to get on the GI Bill after being in the military, and he died while he was overseas. And I think this, it just plays so well, where you get Dominic Cecil, who's like this entitled rich kid, and she's dealing with the loss of her son, who was who got, who was in the school only because she worked there and lost his life so that he can try to better his life later, whereas this kid, like, he is like a true little shit through the through the beginning of the movie like he has to go through his learnings and like he just comes off as like a complete little dirtbag asshole teenager kid and i think he played that very well and i and i the how they humbled him in the end i thought played really well i know i'm kind of jumping all over the place but this movie like there's just so much to uh, there's just so much to enjoy like Paul Giamatti almost becomes a father to this kid. Like mm-hmm. I felt like each character had their time to shine. And I felt like I like my only gripe is like give us less of that other shit while it was funny and it was entertaining and it gave us a nice setup to what the what the holdovers was gonna be for the three of them. You know, yeah. but we could have gotten a little bit less of that and more of just the three of them. Because I mean What's really interesting is I feel like some of the most important character moments happen when they're just like spending time together in the room. Like when they're in that TV room and she's Mm -hmm. watching that couple show. like Uh, The newlyweds. Newlyweds. Like like to me, that was a lot of times where you see a lot of the character growth, like where they can just sit around and they can just talk. I mean, one really beautiful scene is where... They're all sitting at the dinner table and she brings the thing. She's bringing the food out and she's like, do you want to, do you want to sit with us? And she just looks at that one kid. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm good. And I think those little subtle things, like the movie touches on class, like the Mm -hmm. separation of class, separation of race. And just, I, I, there's just so much to it. There's just so much to appreciate with this film. Like, uh, that's kind of, that. That's where I'm at. I I have a lot more, but that's overall like I really enjoyed it. I thought it does a great job humanizing the three of them, um, and like how Paul Giamatti almost becomes like a father to this boy, like he kind of takes him under his wing, but in doing that, he ends up learning a lot about a lot about himself. Sorry, man. I know that 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 was. I kind of just kind of unloaded on you a little bit, but that's kinda, no, no, no. Those are just my those are just my general overall thoughts of the film. Yeah, you know, and and you make a good point at the begin the beginning of this is that we went into this last week saying that we saw the trailer and I wrote it off like I honestly I wrote this off months ago, so did and I. I was like I saw the trailer for this for another movie and I think it was supposed to come out a little bit earlier, but I think they pushed it back. Um, and I was like, oh, this this doesn't look good. Like I don't I'm not into this at all. And maybe the trailer was meant to be as if it was a trailer from the 1970s. Maybe that was the disconnect. I'm not entirely mm-hmm. sure. Uh, now that I think about it, but it was funny because. Uh, I had reached out to you, it's like, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it to the theater, but I saw that it was available for me to rent at home. <laughs> and so I had to spend the 20 bucks to rent it at home because that was the easiest for me to do it. And when I did that, I was like, damn, I had to spend a whole $20 on a movie I might not even like. <laughs> that that hurts a little bit. Like, because <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want to do that, but like, I couldn't make it to theater any other any other way. So I watched it. 
and I sat down and like the beginning was a little slow for me. Uh, but when we, when we got there and especially toward the end, I was like, Oh my God, this movie, I love this movie, loved this movie so much. Like I wasn't expecting to be so wrapped up into their, into like them being held over there at the school. And it was done so well. And my only regret is that I have the option to pay an extra $10 to own it. And I should have done that. Mm. Be- because what I ended up doing is I saw it in the morning. I went to work and then I came back home and Megan was home and she goes, what are we watching tonight? And I said, honestly, I just watched one hell of a movie this morning. <laughs> I, th- I I think we should watch that. And she's like, you just watched it. She's like, I know that's, that's how good this movie is. I'm willing to watch it again. You watched it and twice. Wow. I watched it because I mean, I had it for 48 hours. I'm like, yeah. give my money's worth here. Um, <laughs> And so we watched it again. I ended up falling asleep halfway through, but Megan woke me up so I can so we can go to bed. And and she was like, "That was amazing." I was like, "Right, that was really good." So I watched it like one and a half times. Mm. Um, but it's for me. It was just goes to show. It's like, I, like even I'll even compare this to also Dream Scenario. Like mm. everything could be good about going into a movie, then you watch the movie and end up not being what you want. And I feel like that's more often the case. Like we're being led to believe through trailers and marketing, this is going to be a good movie you watch, and it's not 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 what we expected. But then there's just some movies that like they didn't do a great job marketing it, but once you see it, you're like, wow, that was incredible. Um, it's I think it really works well as a Christmas movie as well. This is a it's a Christmas movie. Absolutely, it's a Christmas. It's a hundred percent a Christmas movie, and I, I think one of the best things I, I enjoyed about this movie was. That it's also a comedy. There are a lot of moments in there where I just laughed yes. <laughs> out loud, was not expecting. Uh, there was one moment in there. There's a few quotes in there. There's two that I want to talk about. One at the very beginning where there's like, where's Walleye? I don't know. Where is it? Like, I don't know where he is. Like the teacher, his name is Walleye. Mm-hmm. And he goes, he's probably jerking off on the Cobb salad. And then the other kid <laughs> goes, why'd you say that? He's like, because he's Walleye. And he's like, but you, sh- you went straight for the Cobb salad. Wow. I mean – do you know something? Because I eat that Cobb salad. And to me, there was such a genuine concern. He's like, but you, were, you went straight for why? Why would you say that? That's so specific. It's, it's so specific. <laughs> um, that was, to me, I, I die laughing at that. It's just such so, so funny dialogue back and forth. Just like a throwaway line, but it worked for me. The other thing was when they were fast cutting to when he broke his arm and dislocated his shoulder yes. and, and he was being disobedient and he jumps into the gym and he's like, don't you do it. And then he says like a, something in French and runs into the gym, jumps on the thing. And then he just goes, ah, and I thought he was joking at first. And all so of a sudden I. he just, and then, and then it just quicks cut to like Paul Giamatti fibbling with his keys, trying to open the doors and his arm is <laughs> And he goes, where are we? <laughs> and then, he, then you get to watch them reset his shoulder. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that they, they was great. It. It's like, well, you and just it, located your shoulder. We're just going to yeah. pop it back into place. Is it going to hurt? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and it's so funny because, like, even when they're rushing to the car, and he's like, I told you not to go in there. He's like, you're supposed to be my guardian. You know, so nothing happened to me. And he said, you are going to wash your hands of me. And he was being such a little shit. And then when he gets in trouble, then all of a sudden it's his fault when he was creating all those antics. It was it was so genuine. The whole movie was genuine. Yes. Like, I bought into everything. I bought into the dramatic moments. I bought into the comedy. The fact that this guy, this Dominic Sessa, is a first-time actor. He's never been anything before. And he was in the in the drama class. I think one of my fun facts, I might rehash this later, but I'm pretty sure that he was he was a student at the school that they filmed at. Yes, I did I do remember reading that. He, and during shooting, I think he had he actually stayed in his dorm. He stayed in, in his, his dorm. dorm. Yeah. Yeah. Also I think they were looking for someone and they found him with it. And I feel like his dialect was so so good it's like i don't know how to I, i'm trying to replicate him as like walleye he's like oh this guy is right here and he had his voice was so deep yes and it was so like you can tell within his character he was smarter than 
than he led everyone else to believe. Like, obviously, he was getting good grades. He was a good student, but he was just a bad apple, so to speak. Like, he wanted to cause trouble, maybe because he was bored, maybe because of his personal life. And one of the kids, before they went away, said, like, how many schools did you get kicked out of? He was, like, rambunctious, but he also was a very smart kid. Mm. And we learned that through the events of the movie. And the dialogue, to me, one of the best things about this movie is the script. Absolutely. 100%. This was this was hands down rips I've I've seen all year. It was done so well. There was not a throwaway line in there that wasn't meant for something, whether it was meant for the story or meant for comedic effect, but everything just worked so well with the script. I what I also really enjoyed is I think you you were talking about just there's no throwaway line. I would even go as far as say there's not even a throwaway story. Like all the storylines tied back into the main character because we get this side mm-hmm. storyline with this other teacher who's also who's also there. You know, we meet her at the diner, yeah. we go to her Christmas party, but through that we get like this little side arc where Paul Giamatti feels like like he like you could feel that he really liked her or that yeah or that he like he mistook her niceness for like flirtatiousness flirting and mm-hmm. like how that i like how that literally that built right from the beginning of the movie and how it all comes to fruition at the end where he's sitting on the couch and he sees her making out with her fiance or her husband and then like all that tied together and then you just see the look on his face and then it just yeah. it, like it almost reiterated why he is the way that he is so i thought like that little side arc beautifully played into his who he was as a character his his face said everything absolutely absolutely the way that he reacted to them like making out like when he entered the room you're like oh oh shit like you felt that little hope that he had for maybe for himself yeah. it's like because the, there because uh he was the the kid was making fun of him for not like have you even touched a woman and he was like oh you're talking crazy um but you can tell that he was lonely and then there was like a small hope that there could have been a sense of like i can be with this person but again she was already spoken for and you know your your chances are too late and also going back to that upon a second viewing we i thought the first time you met her was at the diner the first time you met her was at the very beginning of the movie when she knocked on his door and gave him Christmas yes, cookies. Yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah, and so I was like, oh, that's her. I, I didn't realize that was the same person. So, like, she works at the school, was on Christmas break. Then it makes sense because she's like, oh, I'm, during the break, I work at the restaurant to make extra cash. And then she lived nearby and to had the Christmas party and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Um, but, yeah, I thought that that whole thing was done very well like this was such a character driven story on all fronts absolutely like i care well. equally about all three of these characters cuz we haven't even talked about the most heart wrenching which is divine joy randolph's character where she's dealing with the while she's still working at the school and she's dealing with the loss of her son i mean you can you can see it on her face when she's at that when mm-hmm. they're having that viewing for him where like you could tell every you know everybody's like there for her but like everybody's like well she's just a cook like you know what i mean like you could tell like they cared but yeah. they also were like going through the what i felt from that was that they cared but they were going through the motions that's kind of that's what i got from that yeah and i you you felt like everyone was going through their own journey and you felt for, like you're saying you you felt for everyone's character but they also at toward the middle end of it they all cared about each yes. other like hey we're all struggling through something but we're all we all have to be here uh, and kind of just stuck it out together. And I think that was like the through line is like, no matter what we do, no matter all, any of our struggles, we have to be here at the end of the day. And so why not be here for each other instead of doing this alone? And I think that's kind of some of the beautiful into it. It's even, I'm reading the, the poster right now, it says discomfort and joy. And I think in a way they found joy in the discomfort that they had to be stuck at the school. I mean, and you even see it where, I mean, with her dealing with her son and then when Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sessa, when they go to Boston on their field trip and he mm-hmm. randomly runs into, he runs into somebody who he went to school with, who know, who almost knows like a different version of him that he like almost had yeah. to, that he had to unwillingly unveil to him. And then, you know, him being complicit and lying for him, 
like it almost it, that's what brought them closer together and i love that that we yeah. that we were able to get that moment we were to get a bunch of these little moments where like they did these little things for each other and that moved the pace forward for them like being for them growing closer together like them having those moments where he could have chosen to call him out and be an asshole to him but he was like ooh this is kind of rough for him like i should be here like you could all when each of them had those decisions to be there for each other when paul giamatti does it for yeah. for the cook when the that little kid when that kid at the table was like talking shit about her where he yeah. like that was like a dad moment he fucking just bangs yeah. on the table he goes hey and I was like, whoa, like he got into dad voice yeah. real hard. Like he made me jump a little bit in the theater. I was like, oh, I'm, <laughs> yes, dad, I'm listening. He, yeah, you're right. He I'm should, listening. he should respect her. He's a little, he's a little asshole. I, I also agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you made a good point about the, you know, Paul Giamatti lying to uh, somebody that he went to school with. And I think that's a response to when they were at the hospital, like the the kid was lying to the doctor oh. or the nurse to make sure they didn't have to go through the insurance and Paul Giamatti went along with it and then a few you know scenes later we see the same instance and happen again where Paul Giamatti clearly is lying about where he is in life and kind of the kid going along going along with it, and kind of helping him as well yeah. kind of showing that he's like wait a minute you just lied i i condone this bad behavior uh i'm gonna go along with he's it it's like aren't you um, a man of like... of whatever i forgot whatever whatever the name of the school yes. is or you're not supposed to these men from this school we don't lie so what are you lying about <laughs> it's and you know it's crazy because upon rewatching, and i wrote this line and kind of going back to how great the script is um when he was talking to the the headmaster and the beginning of the movie paul giamonti was and he was like are you still like on that i didn't give like the mm -hmm. the somebody or the mayor's kid a uh, passing grade he's like he wasn't good he he did not deserve he's like and the headmaster's like i just want you to give him a c just to get him passed and he's like well he didn't deserve a c he failed because he didn't do the things that i had asked him to do and and what paul giamonti said i, I feel like this is what was kind of like the phrase of the movie. Maybe not, but this is how I took it. Um, he said, our true purpose is to produce young men of good character, and we cannot sacrifice our integrity to alter their entitlement. And, and you see that kind of shift in a way, but also staying true to that. Like the true purpose is to produce young men of good character. And he saw good character in um, Dominic Sessa's character. He saw that he was a good person. He saw that he wanted to be like, especially that, that twist when we thought his father was dead and he wanted to go, what we thought was maybe see his grave. Oh, what a and we scene. later found out that we later found out that it was to see his father at, uh, at a mental Institute and, and, you know, Paul Giamatti going along with that so he can see his dad. And I think it was that moment where he saw that he was a good person in there Aside from what he, it appeared to be, he's just this rich kid that's entitled to everything. And then he, I think he realizes that that entitlement maybe be coming from his mother instead of the children. Um, and I just thought that that was just a beautiful way. And especially toward the end of the movie where you clearly, he's in that office and he's talking to the headmaster and he's like, like, you know, I, I will do nothing for these kids because they don't deserve it. And at the end, of the day he sacrifices his job and his career for the kids that he said that he wasn't going to do shit for what a what a beautiful, um, I, such a beautiful I, I was just about to say what a beautiful way that the movie ended and it also and it tied in what we were talking about before how he covered for him because he because it whether he will ever admit it or not and i and i, I got there i just pulled up imdb paul giamatti's character is called paul hunnam Divine to Randos call mm. character is called Mary Lamb, and Dominic Sessa is Angus T Tully. Yes, Mr. Tully. I hear Mr. It Tully. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Tully. Um, Mr. Tully. <laughs> uh, they. I mean, he loves. He loved Angus. He loved him. We, they grew. Mm -hmm. They created this friendship, and even like this familial connection over over the season, where they were forced to learn more about each other. Like even mm -hmm. when. Um, Angus goes into the he's in the kitchen with Mary. Oh, and also for Divine Joy, Joy Randolph, I found out she actually did all the cooking 
for the film. She wanted to do it herself. Really? Yeah, they didn't have anybody do it. She did it all herself. And she actually picked oh, wow. She actually picked what they were going to eat for the holiday meal together so that she could prepare it. So she actually she picked Fantastic. and she made that meal herself. I just thought that was a cool production note. Um, yeah, I, I think this, this is a beautiful – I mean, it's a beautiful film. It absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, another scene I want to talk about is the cherry jubilee. This was toward the end where they were kind of yes. all together. And another funny comedic moment where the waitress wouldn't serve the cherry jubilee because it had alcohol in it. And and he was like, well, come on, it's his birthday. And then all this stuff and all none of that was true. But she was pretty gun ho about not serving it to him um and then it's like well can we just have a cherry pie to go and they just recreated it outside instead and then it just became on fire and then it wouldn't get it wouldn't let up and <laughs> they're trying to put it out in the snow and another another wonderful genuine moment that they had to kind of connect with one another that, like at that point they were all on the same page it's like come on come on lady like it's just cherry jubilee yes like, it's, that's so tr- it, it's almost like that familiar moment where like you're trying to do something nice for the kid, but then this, like, like yeah. you're busting my balls. Like, seriously, like, you know that <laughs> yeah. the alcohol cooks out. Like, you're going to make this a big deal. Yeah. It's like, you know what? We're going to do it ourselves. And then it becomes, like, this, 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 like, mess. But then the mess and, like, just them trying that, like, that in itself is all that kid needed. He goes, this, that him probably doing that and them lighting on fire and putting it out was probably better than any Cherry Jubilee he ever would have got at that restaurant because of that that Absolutely. experience that they had together in that, for that moment. Yeah, and even like, it was such a nice touching moment where toward the end and he already got fired and he's clearing out his office and he's like, what are you going to do now? He's like, ah, oh, I think I'm going to write that book. Mm. Like, I think I'm going to write that book and like, he, he's in the car. He's like, so do you want to, want to go grab a beer and he's like you just don't quit do you like he's already <laughs> at school he sacrifices for you willing to skip class so we can go have a beer together it's like come on kid stay in yeah. school um and it was just a genuine moment and the and the what did he he took he what was it was it bourbon he took the alcohol oh yeah it was like his, brandy uh, or bourbon or scotch it was some something. some expensive ass liquor <laughs> Yeah, and and he drank it and he spit it out in the on the school grounds before he drove away, um, and you can just tell that through this experience, even though he got fired, it was it was even though he devoted his whole life to the school, it was worth it at the end of the day for him, and and opened and opened the door. You're like, hey, I did something good for somebody, and, and and opened a door for him to maybe do something else that he wouldn't have done otherwise if he was if he felt trapped in the school, as if he was again held over there for the entire winter break. Um, and I don't know. I just, I, I love that ending. Yeah. Like it was so satisfying. And then you even see it in his voice that he, he lied to him again, something that he swore that, he, that is not the integrity of the school and what their values are to lie. And the kids and he, and the parents were quick to send him to military school. Yeah. It's like, if you just screwed up one more time, he's like, Hey, just let me know how he coerced you. And we you know, we'll just make this go away. And he was like, no, I encouraged it. Like he didn't have to do that, nope, but he did. And he did it anyway. Yeah, he did it because he because he loves him. I mean, yeah. Like it, and that's the beauty. And that is like that in itself is the gift, the Christmas gift that he gave. He gave him, regardless if he mm-hmm. helped him, if he helped him, with well, the gift for him was him helping him, was him yeah. giving sacrificing himself so that this kid can have a, a future there, and to try to do better. And also Paul G. Monty, when he was leaving the office and he was talking to the prime minister, another funny moment where he was like, you are penis cancer in human form. And he's kind of stormed out. <laughs> it's like, what, what a line. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm trying to look at some of the um, uh, some of the fun facts I wrote down, uh, even though the movie features a heavy film Look, reminiscent of the 1970, the movie was shot entirely on an Ari Alex uh, yeah. Mini. I guess it's a camera. Mm-hmm. Um, all the hallmark, all the hallmarks are celluloid film, uh, like a film grain, and uh, kind of dirt and great weave, and were added in post production. So all the things that made it look like it was on film, um, or at least parts of it was shot, uh, was all done digitally. Uh, I thought this was great. Many scenes were filmed at uh, Fairhaven High School in Fairhaven, uh, Massachusetts, in February of 2022 during the school's February break. At this time, the area received a snowstorm to the delight of the film crew. The scenes took place during a snowstorm. It took full advantage of the weather and the snow you see in the film. 
and was was from the actual snowstorm. I think part of that is like the very beginning of the film. They were like this like this chorus that was singing and you saw all these different shots of uh, Massachusetts. I think that was probably part of that. They probably got these great, beautiful shots. To, then they probably wanted to showcase it throughout the movie. I mean, beautiful um, scenery that I mean, just white powdery snow everywhere. It's absolutely. Um, and then they, it claims perhaps intentionally Paul Hunnam's played by Paul Giamatti's lazy or glass eye consistently switches from his left eye to his right eye in different scenes throughout the film, making the viewer, making the viewer shares Tully's confusion of which eye to look at. <laughs> it was a scene that it was a comment that he made during bowling and they intentionally had switched which eye it was in, which was kind oh, of, I didn't even recognize that. I didn't even catch that. Neither did I until I read it. Um, but yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, but with all that, Ernesto, your final thoughts, I guess. Um, this movie was incredible. This is way more than I expected it to be. I expected, I just didn't really, I guess I didn't really expect anything. Um, I thought, I thought it was a beautifully written script. Uh, just the cinematography, the view, this, the, the feel that they were able to give, give us, uh, that time capsule feeling like it legitimately felt like this movie was made in the seventies and that it just was just uncovered for us to see now in 2023. So I understand that that was the vision and I, I, I you know, and this is like, it's set in the seventies, but the movie's almost timeless. Cause it, yeah. it very rarely mentioned like, it just, it's just kind of like where it is in that point in time. Like this movie can easily be rewatched year after year after year. Like it's, and that, and that, I don't typically say that for like a like Oscar Beatty movies because mm-hmm. it's all it is very Oscar Beatty as well, but yeah. it also is very well written and it's just very well constructed. I want to I would love to see this nominated for obviously for uh, original screenplay, uh, Paul Giamatti. All I would all uh, mention for all three characters here is especially for Divine Joy Ro- Rudolph, Randolph. Excuse me. Um, yeah, no, I think the fact that, you know, we, we talked about, you know, for example, Killers of the Flower Moon and how a lot of people are praising that movie for what it is. But I think at the end of the day, what we resonate with more, and I can even use Coda as an example of this, is like, it's such a human yes. story, and anyone can relate to a human story. And when you're able to touch the audience that way of all this relatability and maybe you're not used to being held over at a, on a you know, on school grounds for a winter break, but you can understand some of the feelings of, you know, one character feeling grief, another one feeling loneliness, another one feeling that they don't belong in their, you know, they can do better for themselves and all of that kind of mixed in together. It was so, like, when you look at the Oscars, I consider this as a full Absolutely. meal. Absolutely. Best picture. To me, this. Hands down. Best picture, 100%. This has everything from the cinematography to the actors to the to how the way it was directed. Um, but I think more more than anything. Good. You're right. I am, but I was going to wait for you. I was waiting for you to finish your thought. <laughs> Uh, I, I felt like you're about to die. I, I, I saw your face. And you're like, I got to say something right now. That's why I stopped. Uh, I was like, I would, I would just as when you're talking about the Oscars, I, I didn't even think about it. Production design, of uh, uh, production, hairstyle, oh, yeah. makeup, especially for it being a timepiece for being set in the seventies for it to hit it so flawlessly and how that tied into the cinematography as well. Like it really, really is the whole meal. And when, for my final thoughts, I forgot to give you my letterbox score. I'm going to go with five. Five. Um, yeah, and so I, I think that the, um, the for me the script was probably the biggest thing I, I enjoyed most about this movie. So if this were to win any award, for me hands down for best original screenplay, it's it's just like I don't know. It just felt so captivating and so engaging and so so human. The fact like that you're willing to go back to it so recently and that I can yeah. easily see myself watching this next year during Christmas. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is easy and like, it's, it's great because there's a reason to go watch any movie, you know, again, for whatever reason you want. But I feel like when it comes to the holidays, especially movies that take place during a holiday season, it's easy to watch that movie every year because that's what you do around the holidays. You watch, you watch Christmas movies during the holidays and you yeah. go back and you watch the same ones over and over again. So we were talking about earlier with spirited. That's a new one in the rotation because it was so fun to watch. This one honestly makes me feel like in a way, this is 
in my opinion, a better story. It's very different story, but like a better story than or like a Christmas story. Mm. Like a Christmas, this reminds me of the feel that a Christmas story had where, and like, I guess maybe just because it was like in the 70s and it felt like it was an old timey ish movie, like you said, a time capsule feeling. Mm -hmm. I feel like this invokes the same thing. So the story is very much different, but it invokes the same feeling that I think people would have when you watch a Christmas story. And I never had that feeling with the Christmas story, but I 100% have that feeling with this movie. And to agree with you that this movie for me is five out of five stars, it's it, it kind of blew my mind away on what this movie was perceived to be and what we actually got. Um, it's arguably best picture material. And maybe worth winning. I we have to see what the what the results and the official nominations are. But like, there's not many movies that I saw this year that I want to immediately watch again. That's um, a good point. And so the fact that it was able to do that, and I didn't like, I didn't feel like I was like, oh, I just watched this. It was kind of overdoing it. But like, I felt I was right back into it because, and in, like, I wanted to see what I might have missed the first time, um, or maybe there were throwing in little nuggets that I wasn't paying attention to earlier in the film than they were throughout the film. Mm. But I, I love this movie. I, I think part of the reason why I like it so much, because I wasn't expecting it because yeah. a trailer told me that I wasn't going to like it. And then it proved me wrong. A hundred percent. Happily um, proved you wrong. Happily proved me wrong. And I just want to go back to the, the writer, the fact that this is his, you know, his, his um, writing debut for a feature film. Let's uh, let's have more of that. Yeah. Give this guy another. Give this guy another crack at another script. Like I'm, Absolutely. I'm here for whatever he's, whatever he's gonna put down. Yeah, he has my attention, and I did not watch. I did watch Downsizing, which I did not like that movie. Um, going from Alexander Payne, but it makes me more interested to watch The Descendants or Nebraska because uh, I feel like those are more drama heavy, and I think those two movies were also nominated uh, for, um, for the Oscars. I believe he's already won. And Oscar is going to double check that. Um, for Sideways, maybe? For He's won two Oscars already. He's won one Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay for The Descendants in, 2020, in 2012. And he won for Best Adapted Screenplay uh, for, for Sideways in 2005. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I don't think he was credited as a writer. And I think, if I read this correctly, I think this is one of the first films that he did not have a hand in writing. Mm. Um, I could be wrong by saying that, but I think I read that somewhere. And so, so with that, he definitely has an eye and was definitely, this felt very personal to him, um, some way, shape or form. So again, love this movie, hands down five out of five stars. I look forward to talking about this again, when we are comparing it to other films, when it comes to award season, cause I'm, I'm pretty certain after watching this movie, it's, it's going to be up there. Oh, it's absolutely going to be, it had, it better be in the conversation. It needs to be. And again, as we talk about our recap of 2023, as we talk about the best of, th this is a high contender for me as well. This is this is up there for some of the best movies I've seen this year. Well, let's look at let's look at some of their uh, financials here. Oh yes, yes. So, do you happen to have their budget information? I I was looking this up earlier, and I couldn't find a definite answer on how much the budget was. I can relook again as we are going through that. But world you know, domestic it hit fifteen million, which I guess for a movie like this seems average. It's average because it, it does it didn't have a it seems like it didn't have any like I mean it doesn't even have an international release. So it's only it's only here in our market here. So it's yeah. not gonna you know you're not gonna look at a big budget. But I think for a small film like this, fifteen million is great. Yeah. Um, this is from Collider. It, it doesn't look like I'm getting much. They're saying this passes after adding. Um, they're saying that this potentially cost $30 million. Ooh. Um, I'm not getting a, uh, a definitive answer here. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they... I'm not sure if those numbers were out just yet. Or I I believe the film... Okay, so the film premiered at Telluride Film Festival early this year, where it was scooped up by Focus Features for a reported $30 million. So we don't know how much the movie cost, but we know how much Focus Featured paid for it. So I guess that's something to go off of. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, once Oscar season comes out and more people hear about it, then the push, the push, you know, it'll see a resurgence later. But I'm, I'm here for it. More people need to know about this film. More people need to see it. It's fantastic. Go yeah. see it. And, it, you know, and it's one that can be enjoyed every Christmas. Yes, 100%. I, this will definitely be in the rotation. Like I said, my only regret is not spend the extra $10 so I can own it. Because <laughs> I think if somebody else asked, I would watch it again in a heartbeat. Yeah. So, but anyway, there you go, guys. That's a full show for you guys. Uh, episode 197 in the books. Tell our lovely listeners and us know what they can look forward to next week. Oh, next week. We got a special guest back next week. And we are going to be reviewing... Oh, shit. How do you... Uh, Hayao, <laughs> Hayao Miyaz- Miyazaki? Is mm-hmm. that how you pronounce it? Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Let's see. Yeah, Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah. He's going to be... He's directing The Boy and the Heron. Um, he's the director, Studio Ghibli. Um, and we're going to have uh, Matt Klesinek. He was on when we reviewed uh, Akira. Akira, yep. He was, which was also another anime. And he's going to be on. He's going to be talking about that. Well, he's also going to be talking about his podcast, Boards to Buckets. Which I'm curious, I'm you know, where to I'm curious to hang out and chat with him again and get his insight. He's the one who hooked me on to Tokyo Vice, so by the next time he comes on, I should have finished it. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward into diving into it because that's going to be our, I guess, it's technically going to be our foreign film for this month. Yeah, and I a lot of buzz was surrounding it. I remember we were talking about this movie earlier this year about the marketing, how there was zero. He decided not to release a trailer. He not he only released one image, and it was a very like nondescript poster of the movie. And then after that, he was keeping quiet. Obviously, this film was already um, released in, I believe, in Japan. It was released. I believe yes. And, yeah, and so now it's hitting the worldwide market. So obviously, as as you know, the film's already out. So we're seeing more posters and more trailers about it. But because the the creator was more specific about not seeing it, I'd never seen a trailer, and I only know the poster, the more recent poster that came out, the one that's advertising their stacked, dubbed voice cast, uh, just to name a few. Christian Bale, Dave Bautista, Gemma Chan, William Dafoe, Mark Hamill, Robert Pattinson, Florence Pugh. Mm. Well, mm. I might have to. I might have to watch it subbed then. I, I, I have. A, I had it booked to see it subbed with the Japanese. Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know though. I, oh, I'm so torn. I, <laughs> I, I'm seeing it dubbed. So uh, I, I mean, that's no no surprise there for you, Ernesto. I know. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I don't know. I was really interested in the voice cast. And so maybe if you see it in sub, then I see it in dub. We'll make, might walk out with two different experiences. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not, not going to tell you how to watch the movie. You can watch it however you want. Well, most <laughs> of his stuff is on Max right now. So it's safe to say that this is going to be online somewhere later. So I don't know. I could always rewatch it later. Very I, true. I'm going to watch it subbed because I'm okay. very adamant about watching it in the voice that it was recorded in. Although I do love to hear the voice the voice cast sounds it absolutely incredible yeah and this movie was getting a lot of buzz and it still is it's i feel like it's be like when it comes to animated movies this one is almost certain to be up there for best animated feature at the oscars and i feel like everything that i've been hearing it's either going to be down to spider-man or this movie when it comes to who's winning the award these are the two movies i guess we're gonna find out next week we're going to find out next week. I look forward to having Matt back on the show. I haven't seen him in a while, so uh, he's 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 more of our anime guy. So I'm glad. To, I'm really curious what he has to say about all this as well. Um, so there you go. If you want more from us, you can always follow us on our social media channels on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok at Box Office Bingers. Our Instagram and Threads page at Box Office underscore Bingers, and our X and Letterbox page at Box Office Binger without the S because apparently that costs more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we can't afford the extra S on those two. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for listening to us just talk about, about movies. Really do appreciate it. Come back next week for more movie fun. You're not going to regret it. And for that, I've been your host, Matt Diaz. Ben Ernesto Santos. See ya. <laughs>